Welcome everybody to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to our uh, illustrious gathering tonight. And uh, we're gonna be having tonight a, a good speaker on from the uh, Joe Jennings from the International Schiller Institute who's gonna be talking about uh, information warfare and NATO's proxy war against Russia and all that other stuff. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period by Charlie. Second, Joe Jennings will have up to an hour to speak. And then we'll have a question and answer period with them. After that, we'll each have a chance to get rebuttals. We normally finish up about nine o'clock. So Charlie, uh, if you're ready, and there are two rules to the college. One is one fool at a time. And the second one is no personal attacks. Uh, that means I can't call Charlie a schmuck, which I usually wind up doing anyway, but that's another story. Um, with that, uh, Charlie, if you're ready to get started, uh, I'll share my screen so we can do the announcements with you. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,690 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, as usual, we have a Google email group. If you'd like to receive uh, email updates on the topic for the coming week, there's very little traffic on that. And we also maintain a meetup group. Uh, information on, on subscribing to either one of these or both of them is available on our main website at the center at the top. Okay, uh, first of all, everyone please respect uh, the audience in particular our guest speaker by muting themselves please do it right now put a nice red X over your microphone okay secondly um, in our lecture library last week's presentation by the state chair uh, uh, mr. Garfield to the independent voters of Illinois on how to be an informed voter with a PowerPoint that's been posted in our lecture library, if you'd like to review that. So that was last week's lecture on October the 15th. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming schedule. On November the 5th, we will be opening up again in face-to-face -face meetings at Dapper's East Restaurant, 2901 West Addison, with free parking. The uh, things, there's some adjustments that need to be made. Our starting time will be at five o'clock. The meetings will be from five until eight, due to the fact that the restaurant is not open late. Also, I have not verified this, but I've also been informed that the hours of the Addison Street bus have been extended, but I'll have to check into that if you're coming and going there via, via public transportation. Um, I usually don't do this, but I would like to announce in advance in celebration of this event, we will not be charging tuition that evening so if you want to get a deal this would be the time to show up um i was thinking perhaps a lot of store and people have had stored up topics so we'd like to oh yeah make it an open mic presentation now what i mean by an open mic is that it doesn't mean that there is no structure uh, we generally, try, generally, we try to schedule three, T H R E E, keynote speakers uh, from five to ten minutes each, followed by questions. So, if you'd like to be a keynote speaker, uh, please send me a title and a sentence or two describing what you would like to present to the college. Now, after the keynote speakers and question period. We will open it up for anyone to make comments in that regard. Now, regarding keynote speakers, 
please, I would like to make it topical. This should be events I would like to keep it confined to the items that are in the news. If you are one of those who suffers from, I would call it a condition of fixation, we don't want to hear that your fixation for the 10th time again. But we certainly welcome keynote speakers, but please make it something that, let's say, is written about if I purchase a newspaper on that day. But anyone who'd like to, please contact me. My email address is on the, the page. All I need is a simple title and sentence. Um, okay. Um, following that, on November the 12th, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a retrospective, but I am going to be bringing it up to date. I will be speaking on how it was, it was in fact communism that defeated fascism in World War II and look at battles in a relatively unknown struggle. I've been researching this for a number of years and it should be an interesting program from both the store. And I conclude the program that there is a continuing and ongoing conflict between communism and fascism in progress at as we speak within the United States. So it's actually a two-part program, how the communists and the fascists are still engaged in conflict at this very day. If you'd like, or as we resume our normal schedule, beginning on November the 19th and the 26th of November. I have some invitations uh, outstanding, but if you'd like to speak and haven't spoken in a while, please contact me and if appropriate, we'll get you on the schedule. Okay, and by the way, I wanted to add regarding our meeting in person uh, arrangements. We will continue, I am assured by our technician, Tim, that we will continue to broadcast on Zoom. We would also like to set up, and as other organizations do, you also can attend the programs on YouTube. So you will have a choice of either participating in person on Zoom are on YouTube. Now, if you're attending the college in those situations um, electronically on the internet, you will be precluded from full participation. We're thinking that perhaps at most you could post questions in writing in the chat in some fashion like that um, or by email, but it will be confined but nevertheless, we will try to accommodate all people uh, in this regard so that you will have three options for attending the College of Complexes. Sounds pretty good to me. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Thank you very much, Tim. Take it away. All right. Um, Joe, if you're ready to go, uh, to start your presentation and share your screen when you're ready. Okay. Um, you all see me, right? You can yes. See me. Hello. So I am uh, Joe Jennings. I am speaking to you from Houston, Texas. I don't know how the weather is up there in Chicago, but it's still kind of balmy down here. And being as it's uh, the 29th of October, I decided to wear my uh, Halloween colors and my tie tonight. And I think it's pretty astounding when Charles says that this group, your group, has been, what, 3,690 uh, progressive uh, episodes of College of Complexes. So, so that's uh, that's something. There's a, a, a kind of spirit that keeping this uh, this group going, and that's good. There's got to recruit young people. That's important. Um, so, uh, uh oh. So I just shared the screen, and it doesn't look anything like what I was uh, expecting to pop up here. Uh, no, 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 no. Let's see this here. Nope. Joe, we haven't seen it yet. Try your share screen button on the bottom and then just hit your PowerPoint and we'll see it. Okay, there's there's the share screen. I hit it, but what pops up is not 
what I expected. Uh, I'm gonna go back because I. Is when your I, PowerPoint open? Well, I did. I never closed it when I when I took oh. my break. It was all sitting there. It is now. Do you see it? Do you guys no, see? Yeah. No, we got to share screen, and then you got to hit the PowerPoint in the second arrow. Well, I've got the PowerPoint now, but I don't have the the share screen. So let me try okay. again here. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, oh. Looking, looking, looking. Open up your Zoom app. I got my Zoom app here. On the bottom, hit share screen. If the window's open, you'll see your PowerPoint. Well, I see my PowerPoint, but it, but you guys obviously don't see it. Well. But I, like I said, I was all set to go when I when I took my little break there. Uh, not that's not what I want to see. Because we still can't see anything yet on your on your share screen function. Okay. Well. Hit your share screen again. No, I don't. I don't have it. I don't have it. I, it's not. Let me. Bottom bottom part and the toolbar will pop up on your Zoom. Go to your Zoom app. I'm at my Zoom app. On the bottom part, about towards the middle, you'll okay. see something called share screen. Not not there yet. Somehow F Firefox jumped in here. Turn okay. off. Turn off your Firefox browser. I don't want it. I don't want it at all. No one invited Firefox to be part of this party here tonight. Okay. Okay. On the bottom of your Zoom application, there should be a button that says share screen. Can you see it? I was all set to go, guys. Yeah, I know you were. Okay, there we go. Share screen. I hit share screen. Then hit your PowerPoint. Hit my PowerPoint. Yeah, it'll open it. When you hit your share screen, you'll have a, a window that opens up that'll give you a whiteboard, phone, iPad, and, it's, and it should have your uh, PowerPoint there. Okay. Do you see the beginning of the PowerPoint? You see the no, not yet. No, not yet. You gotta, you gotta take it. Hit the share screen, then you gotta hit the PowerPoint with your button. Okay. I was all set to go, guys. I know, I know, I know. Make certain your PowerPoint is open. Of course Before it's open. You share. I'm looking at it. I'm all right, now, uh, go back to Zoom. I'm clicking Zoom, clicking, clicking, clicking. Nothing's happening. Your Zoom application should be open because we are seeing you. Yeah, it is open. Maxim maximize your uh, Zoom right now. Can you see all of us in like a, a gallery view yet on Zoom? Okay. Or right, if you open up your Zoom thing on the bottom, you should see share screen. In the Zoom application, not on your toolbar. Okay. Hit the share screen, then you hit then another window will open up. I, 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 um, because we can see you with no trouble. Yeah, that's good, but but and I can see you, but you can't see the uh, the PowerPoint. Okay, again, go back, hit share screen. I'm looking for it, guy on the bottom, uh, it's, it's middle. Try moving everything up of the zoom of the zoom app. Maximize your zoom app. And the zoom app is the little camera on the bottom on the bottom bar, correct? Yeah, but then open it. Open up your zoom. You can open up your zoom and share screen at the same time. Okay. Can you see us on the zoom application right now? Well, I can see you. Okay. Um, does it look like a little window or something right now in there? Maximize that window. Resume. The little, the little box there in the upper right-hand corner. Now on the bottom, you should see share screen of the Zoom window.
You don't see it yet, do you? Don't see it. Don't see okay, it. Okay, now, did you maximize the zoom window open? Seem to be getting further away from it, guys. Okay. Just maximize your zoom first, okay? I'm The only thing I know how to do with zoom is to click this little uh, camera on the bottom. You know how to, is it, is it open in your computer right now? Can you see us? I can see you, Charles. I mean, not Charles. I can see you. Uh, Up at the, look, 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 where it says on Zoom, go to view. And just hit the, uh, uh, go to, go to full screen. You see it now? Because on the bottom, you should see a share screen button. Of the zoom app. Okay. Maybe I, maybe I should just exit out and come back in again. No, you're 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 fine. You just need to, your PowerPoint's open, correct? Well, I'm gonna um, right now. I'm not sure if it is open. I might have gotten out of it. So. Okay. Open your PowerPoint first. Make okay. sure that's open. Okay. Make sure your PowerPoint's open. Okay, is it open now? Hang on. Don't worry, Joe. We'll get you hooked up here pretty okay, quick. Okay, well, I'm, I've got my PowerPoint up, sir. Now, go to your Zoom window. Which is, it's a window. I'm looking at a little icon on the bottom. Am I looking for a window? You're looking for your Zoom window, yes. You should see a Zoom window there. Where you see me at is where the Zoom window's at. You can see me, right, on the screen? I can screen. see you. I've never lost you. Yes, I can see okay, you. Okay, now, right there on that window, is it a small window or a large one? Okay, right on where that window is at there, somewhere there's going to be a share screen button, whether it be up on the right or on the bottom. It's, it's usually in green, lime green, right? Usually in the middle of the screen at the bottom. Yeah, I know. I, we, once we, you found, have that. we found it once or twice, but now, now I don't know how to get back to it. I'm sorry, guys. Maximize your Zoom window. Bob, can you help him for a minute? I got to go shut a door here real quick and get this background noise out of here, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. All right, just, just help him for a minute. Joe, you should... Bob's going to be able to help you out real quick. Okay. I'm going to mute for a minute while I get this background noise. Yeah. Hey, Joe, the screen you're on right now, do you see all the people in the room? Do you see me? Uh oh, I, don't, I just lost you. Just lost Joe. I think he closed Zoom. Oh, until Joe comes back, um, before I uh, left for the city this morning on the train, and I've been out all day, I've been detached. I just sat down just now at the computer, but uh, I heard that the last I heard was that the guy who uh, hammered Paul Pelosi turned out to be a male prostitute, and they were fighting over drugs. Anybody heard any updates on that? Who's no, Paul? I haven't heard anything about that at all. Who's Paul Pelosi? Paul Pelosi, uh, Nancy Nancy Pelosi's husband, oh. Speaker of the House. Okay. You don't like her. So I guess, I guess this guy's been seen going in and out of the Pelosi home before. And he may have been the unknown passenger in Pelosi's car when he when he got pulled over for drunk driving a few months back. Oh. Oh. 
<laughs> and this guy's been this uh, this guy, this uh, David De De Pope or whatever his name is. Um, he's he's had trouble. He's been in trouble with the law before for male prostitution. Uh oh. Hello. Yeah. How, how, oh. how is she doing now? Uh, Nancy Pelosi has husband. Um, I they're expecting to make a, they expect him to make a recovery. He had a fractured skull. Mm -hmm. So when the police got when the police got there, um, Paul Pelosi and the and Tim, this male prostitute Tim, were both in their underwear fighting in. over a hammer. Oh, that back in. Oh. Tim, uh, Tim's there. away from the Tim's away from the keyboard. Yeah, he's away from the keyboard. We didn't, we didn't really want to drop there this is. thing. Someone's got to let Joe. We didn't really want to drop this thing. I just did. He's coming. Hey, Joe. There how we you go. Doing? Okay. Hey, I'm mute, Joe. I'm back. Okay, I Joe, you just unmuted on the same line as your mute button to the right in the middle of the screen. It should say. Share screen. Yeah, I've got, I've got that. Got so now okay. I've got it. Okay, and now hit sure. your share screen and then hit your PowerPoint window. All right. Okay, there it is. Uh, do you see it? No. God damn it. Share screen and then hit your PowerPoint again. Okay, there's my share screen. Now, in your PowerPoint, you should be able to see it. If not, just hit, uh, hit and screen. And there, I just put my PowerPoint up, but you don't see it? No, you got to hit, you got to get, when you open that window up where it says screen or your PowerPoint. Okay, now we got it, Joe. Now All right. Okay, so, right, so what, okay, so what do you see? So what do you see up on the screen right we now? You're seeing, just leave it as is. We see your desktop. Yeah, and let you open your PowerPoint. And we'll see it from here. Just leave it. You're good to go. Yeah, we can see everything now. Is it full screen, or do, do I need to enlarge it, or you no? Good? No, you, it's, we're seeing exactly what you're seeing, Joe. Okay, so look. Um, in war, truth I'll is. I'll go to slideshow. I'll go to slideshow. Are, are you good? And the recording is still going. Recording's going, but yes. Okay. Go to slideshow and then hit hit for uh. Hit, hit slideshow. Yeah, and now we can see everything with no trouble. Okay, right. so look, um, thank you uh, with your uh, uh, technical genius, Tim. I, I assume you're going to uh, delete the first 10 minutes of this thing. We'll probably it goes be able to. Yeah, we'll be able the to. Okay. But um, yeah, the title of this, um, and I did present it exactly one month ago today to the group in, in, um, in Dallas, but things change. Things change every day right now your makes your head spin uh and I, I will say that we are in a very very dangerous moment in history right now and um i'm actually quite interested in what charles said in terms of his uh initiative uh, his class on the 12th about how the communists defeated the fascists well there's certainly an element of that you know i i went to um a few years ago, they have a, a day of remembrance. Uh, 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 there is a Russian community here in in Houston, and I was there. And you know what they, the tradition is: you you bring the picture of your father or your grandfather or your uncle who who who, who was honored in Russia in fighting the Nazis. And I I brought a picture of my father, you know, who was a bomber during World War II, uh, based in London, but. You know, for all the Hollywood epics about um, World War II, you know, the longest day, saving Private Ryan, Torah, 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 so forth and so on. I've never seen a movie, you know, extolling the role of Russia in that war. And yet Russia lost 25 million of its own brothers and sisters to the Nazis, you know, a um, uh, hundred times more than America, uh, than, than the U.S. lost, and yet, um, and I'm not, um, I'm not downgrading the role of America at all, because if it wasn't uh, a, a certain uh, understanding between Franklin Roosevelt and, and Stalin, um, 
um, you know, particularly in terms of the armaments and the shipments, then the, the Nazis, you know, fascism could, could well have been. Um, small criminal. I'm small sorry, what, criminal. What the heck small is going criminal. On? Michael Jackson. Tim, something crazy just happened. Anyway, uh, so so we, we need to think about that uh, because what the update I just got a few minutes ago was that um, both in terms of the bombing of, of the uh, Russian merchant ships in Sevastopol that were supposed to be the escorts for the grain shipments out of Ukraine, this very delicate agreement that was worked out, as well as the bombing or the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines, um, which were blown up, um, I think, on the 27th of September, um, and, and thereby cutting off Europe from its um, the, the, the uh, energy supplies it was uh, counting on, the Russians are now saying that the culpable party in both of these is the British. That is what they're saying, particularly the British role in running the sabotage through drones of the, of the pipeline and the bombing of the, um, of the ships, um, merchant ships in Sevastopol. Fuck so this, you, fuck so, you, it be Palestine, uh, you piece of shit! Shut uh, up! Shut the talking. fuck up! I'm on fuck! Tim, is this deliberate? I hope not. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna proceed because it, for, for me, this is not academic. So uh, the question is, uh, tr in war, truth is the first casualty. Who said that? That was first said by, um, it's attributed to a, a Republican senator named Hiram uh, Johnson uh, from California who called himself a progressive Republican and opposed U.S. entry into World War I. Um, and, and that is uh, certainly at issue today because, you know, you hear this word now, narrative, a lot. Uh, um, who's got the winning narrative? But then there's something called truth. And you know when, um, if, you, if you ever have to testify in a trial, you hold up your right hand and you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, but is there truth or is, or is it just a question of who's got the more powerful narrative? Does, does the narrative define reality? Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I mean, this is something that really uh, perplexed um, and was of, uh, you know, the early uh, Christian era, um, the, the, the Gospel of, of St. John was written um, long after, you know, Jesus Christ had, had passed uh, in a situation where the world looked like it was descending into a dark age. What could they descend upon? And whoever wrote the Gospel of John, he, 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 he discusses this. And with Christ appeared before Pontius Pilate, and, and Pilate says, well, who are you? What are you here for? He says, I'm here to testify and be witness to the truth. And then Pilate says, well, what is truth? All right. And, um, you know, the narrative um, that prevailed that day uh, sent Christ to his crucifixion. But I, I, I just, I, I, but there, there's another one. Um, in the same gospel where the, the, the disciples are trying to figure figure it out. He's, and who is this man? And he says, um, well, if, if you, if you, if you, if you adhere to what I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you, you will understand the truth and the truth will set you free. And they say, well, we're all children of Abraham. We've never been enslaved. Um, but I, 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 I looked this up because uh, that saying is in, etched in the floor of a very significant government building just outside Washington, D.C. And here you see the gentleman. I don't know what he, who he is, but he's um, there in, etched in the granite in the opening uh, hallway is, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Anybody know what that building is? Anyone want to guess? Well, I'll tell CIA, you. CIA, CIA. That is correct. Yes, it's, CIA. It's, it's a CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Now think about that in terms of all the falsehood, falsification we can look back on.
in terms of the weapons of mass destruction that were never found uh, in Iraq. You know, the lone uh, theory about who ran the September 11th attacks, you can even go back to the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which justify um, the, the escalation in, in the Vietnam conflict. So that, 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 that really takes chutzpah on their part to put that out there. Or maybe there was a time when the CIA, certain people were dedicated to the truth, but not in my lifetime. Now this, this, this is, um, um, is something I'm reminded of, and, and I guess everyone should remember to mute again since I asked you to jump in. Um, in a, a book um, um, which is a very difficult read because it's so pessimistic, uh, but it was A Vision of the Future by George Orwell, written in about 1947-48, called 1984, okay? Uh, at the point that the great accomplishment of World War II um, with uh, the uh, defeat of the Nazis was blown away almost immediately uh, by a new division of the world between the communists and the West. and um, and, um, you know, under that period, which in the U.S. also was known as McCarthyism, but you had a parallel kind of uh, uh, corruption and oppression in, in, in Europe, but particularly in England, all sorts of stuff was justified in terms of surveillance, you know, uh, having to take an oath uh, before, you know, getting your job. And, you know, and George L. Orwell had this what's called dystopian look into the future in this book, 1984, as to what he projected now uh, things would look like. Now, of course, 1984 has come and gone, um, so I don't fixate on the date. But, you know, one aspect of the book is that the world is divided up into blocks, and the blocks, you know, are at permanent war. You know, and as Orwell said, the war helps to preserve the special atmosphere that the hierarchical society needs. War is now a purely internal affair. The war is waged to keep the structure of society intact. You know, and you think about September 11th and the aftermath and how everyone went and put their yellow flags up, you know, and everyone had to prove what a great patriot they were, you know, and yet we know subsequently, and, and frankly, I knew even then, um, that Afghanistan had absolutely nothing to do with those attacks, and yet that was used to justify a 20-year occupation of Afghanistan that, you know, that parked NATO, the so-called North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in the middle of the Eurasian continent for 20 years, um, you know, kind of policing the whole continent, east, west, north, and south, from that position in Afghanistan. Um, what else does Orwell talk about? Well, um, there's got to be an enemy image. I think in the in the in the book is it was Izzy Arnstein or something like that, right? So all the injustices and so forth were projected against the in external enemy, and every every day all the workers would gather around and have something called the ten minute hate, you know, which you would pro project all your emotional enemy against the, uh, energy against this demonic individual that was prescribed to be the enemy. And all the, um, you know, all the injustice and so forth were projected upon this individual. Um, you had universal <coughs> surveillance, you know, un under the uh, dystopian society uh, that Orwell projects. Big Brother is watching you. Now, have people become accommodated to the fact that, you know, that um, every time you log onto the internet, you are you are being surveilled, or at least all the data of, of everything you do is now being, um, you know, stored away in some crypt in Culpeper, Virginia, or some, some such place to be retrieved when it might be of, of use. People have come to accept that, but that is what um, Ed Snowden, you know, courageously uh, was trying to expose, um, and, um, and uh, he put his life at risk to expose that. Uh, and, uh, and he recently uh, assumed a Russian citizenship because he dares not come back here. Another one that was uh, um, uh, exposing aspects of this was, of course, Julian Assange, and he's still in prison in London. Uh, but then you had this phenomenon called the Ministry of Truth, right, where, um, war, where um, truth was, 
whatever Big Brother says it would be. And Winston, the, the, the protagonist in the story, his, he worked for the Ministry of Truth, and his job was to rewrite history um, so that um, depending on who was our, the, uh, um, uh, it's futuristic London, I think, is where this thing takes place. When the alliance is shifted, you know, your, your current enemy is now your ally and vice versa, then everything was re, 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 rewritten to go here with that particular view of history. So, um, you know, I, I just put that forward because, you know, we have been living um, since, uh, you know, particularly since uh, February of this year, you know, a number of big lies that it's very important that people, you know, come to grip with these lies and where they're taking us and why these things are happening. You know, and I, um, I reference that, you know, what's the first big, you know, what is the central lie of what you're witnessing in Ukraine or the f central narrative, let me put it that way, unprovoked war, right? Some fine afternoon, Vladimir Putin decided he wanted to expand you know, into Ukraine, reclaim the Soviet empire, and he ran and he invaded this country in an unprovoked war and, and nations are ordered to line up behind that narrative or there will be consequences. You saw this in the United Nations when um, you had the referendum in Donetsk and Lugansk and, you know, the Russian speaking sectors to the east um, and they voted broadly and there were observers, you know, to, to rejoin uh, Russia. They didn't want to be part of what was coming at them from the western part of Ukraine. But there was a vote of, you know, a, a resolution of condemnation um, to put forward before the entire UN General Assembly. Russia says, okay, let's make it a anonymous, uh, an anonymous vote. Um, so people can really vote their conscience and the UK and the USA and I think France said no every vote's going to be on the record you know and you know they kind of got they what they wanted although I, over 80 nations abstained right but the nations that voted knew that if they didn't line up with uh, the US you know and uh, the, the Western you know rules-based order on this vote there would be consequences terms of toppling of governments, cutting off of aid, and, and more. Um, so was it an unprovoked war? Did it just come out of nowhere in February of this year? Well, let's uh, let's go back and look a, a, a bit of the history that's very well documented. And I'm going to start here with a magazine you're familiar with called The London Economist. Look at the date there, March 17th, 2007. So um, it is... Uh, the, the occasion of this issue is called the EU Fit at 50. So I guess the European Union came into um, uh, existence in uh, 1957. So this would be the 50-year anniversary history. And, it's, and of course, there are a lot of problems and a lot of discontent you know, with the EU. Of course, in England recently, you had the Brexit, but this was back in 2007, okay? But what they what they have in uh, in the final editorial of this issue is a forward-looking kind of dreamy picture that well it ain't that bad, you know what's it going to look like in 50 years, right? Uh, okay, so that was 2007. So they're looking ahead at 2057, right? How many years is that from now? Um, you know, 30 35 years. Um, and, it's, and, and so they're kind of imagining what it would look like. It's kind of, um, and I'm just going to call your attention to one paragraph. Um, the other cause for quiet, should I use a British accent? Maybe not. Uh, the other cause for quiet satisfaction has been the EU's foreign policy. In the dangerous second decade of the century, when Vladimir Putin returned for a third term as Russian president and stood poised to invade Ukraine, it was the EU that pushed the Obama administration to threaten massive nuclear retaliation. The Ukraine crisis became a triumph for the EU foreign minister, Karl Bildt, prompting the decision to go for a further 
big round of enlargement. It was ironic that less than a decade later, Russia itself lodged its first formal application for membership. Okay, so this is in March of 2007. You know, Barack Obama had, had only declared for president three weeks before, and, it was, and he'd only been senator for, what, a year, a couple years? He was definitely not seen as the guy that was likely to win. But here, uh, Sir Evelyn de Rothschild, who is the editor, or was then, of The Economist, is projecting that in the second decade of the 20th century, you would have a nuclear crisis around Ukraine, a brinkmanship crisis uh, that, uh, uh, of the two nuclear armed superpowers confronting each other over Ukraine, and Russia would back down, Putin presumably would be dumped, you know, and uh, you know, Russia would eventually soon humbly uh, submit to join the EU and with it submit Russia to the Brussels and London bureaucracy. So that's what's called a scenario, guys. This was their future-oriented dreaming fantasy of where the world was going to go in 2007, a nuclear war crisis over Ukraine. Um, now, what happened? Well, 2014. What happened in 2014? This was during the presidency of Barack Obama, who the London lords and ladies were projecting to win the election. You had a violent, violent overthrow of the um, Lukashenko government, you know, uh, um, you ha had, had a population that in 1991 had voted twice for neutrality, not to ally with NATO, not to ally with Russia, but to have a neutral relationship with East and West um, and be at peace with its neighbors, kind of like Austria or Switzerland. But that was unacceptable. And so with $5 billion flowing in from the National Endowment for Democracy, from Western foundations, um, you know, traffic through the lady you see in the lower right-hand corner, who, who I call Icky Vicky, that's Victoria Newland. Unless you think this is a partisan thing, she was uh, undersecretary of defense, um, worked directly under Dick Cheney in the GW Bush administration. She went on to become John Kerry's special envoy to Eastern Europe under the Obama administration. So the party, who cares, you know? But this was the gal uh, that bragged, bragged that Western uh, financiers had spent $5 billion financing um, the uh, violent overthrow of the Ukrainian government. And um, President Lukashenko um, was first disposed to put this down and was ordered by John Kerry to stand down. And so the government was overthrown. Now, who was brought in? Well, I'll tell you who. The Nazis. That's what, who was brought in. There's a direct continuity between um, the, um, the pro-Hitler factions uh, that ruled Ukraine, and of course there there was in, in injustices certainly um, uh, during the Stalin period. You know, particularly in terms of what was called the collectivization of the farms in um, on, in, in Ukraine. So certain people uh, in Ukraine welcomed the Nazis, and they had their own uh, their own uh, quisling uh, dictator whose name was Stefan Bandera. But these uh, networks who, who conducted some of the most vicious atrocities, something called the Babayar Massacre in early 1941, before Pearl Harbor, where 30,000 Jews were killed on a single day and buried in a mass grave. Now, what happened to these networks? Well, they were never prosecuted after the war because the Nuremberg uh, trials only mandated that the German Nazis were going to be put on trial. But the Ukrainian Nazis, no, actually, when John Foster Dulles um, headed the, uh, the State Department under Dwight D. Eisenhower, these guys were put on stipend, okay, um, as assets against Russia in the Cold War. And I, I will say that had Roosevelt lived, you know, uh, things would have been much, much different. But um, Harry Truman, um, in the embrace of Winston Churchill, you know, um, was, you know, it, it was Harry Truman that invited Winston Churchill to uh, Fulton, Missouri to give that famous speech we now call the Iron Curtain speech, which divided the world, right? And these Nazis 
were protected as assets against Russia. And it was in that context of this ugly division of the world and everything that flowed from that that George Orwell uh, wrote his final work, uh, 1984. Um, so these are the guys that took over the government in 2014. Um, now, this was not unnoticed in the West. Uh, here we have uh, a letter uh, written to um, um, Secretary of State then Mike Pompeo, um, and you can see the date on it, 2019. You know, the coup was in 2014, but this would have been during the Trump administration, asking Pompeo, you know, you know why, you know, since we're supposedly against terrorism, why why are why are we protecting the Azov brigades, the Azov battalions, um, which is this um, uh, Nazi corps at the center? These are like the brown shirt stormtroopers in the uh, in the uh, uh, Ukrainian regime, <clears throat> and they cite in this letter, which which you can look up, uh, the Azov battalion in terms of its international outreach. Uh, they cite the Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, bombing, um, the, 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 uh, the uh, Charlottesville, remember the Charlottesville thing was kind of gang counter gang with, with the Azovs on one side and Antifa on the other side and ostensibly about the Robert E. Lee statue. But, you know, um, so you had these progressive members of, of Congress uh, asking Pompeo, we shouldn't be funding these guys. And, um, here you can very quickly look at the excerpt from it. For example, the Azov Battalion is a well-known ultranationalist malicious militia organization in U Ukraine that openly welcomes neo-Nazis in its ranks. The group is so well-known, in fact, uh, you know, and, and so forth. So, um, so it was out there. And here are the signatures of the people. The one that uh, comes to my mind is Sheila Jackson Lee, because I'm, I'm. You know, I'm, I'm speaking to you from uh, Texas, and Sheila is someone I've had many, many conversations with over the years. Um, she's not the same woman that I, I, I marched with against Cheney and Bush back in the day as an, as an executive member of the Democratic Party, which I was at the time. But you might recognize um, some from Illinois on that list. I don't know. You, you can because I'm not familiar with the Illinois delegation. But these are what you would call the progressive Dems who were in 2019 calling attention to the neo-Nazi character of the Azov battalions who are at the center of the Ukrainian government. Um, uh, just parenthetically, um, after the um, Russians vanquished, um, uh, you remember there was a, there was a, a, a steel plant or something that these guys were uh, were holed up in in Mariupol. Um, the the Russians uh, forces um, vanquished them, uh, and and basically in the course of the interrogation said, "Take your shirt off. We want to see what you know what's there, right?" And they took pictures of the tattoos of these guys. What do you see there? The Iron Cross on the left, a satanic goat swastikas and so forth, Hitler, Stefan Bandera on the lower right. These are the great democratic f f fighters, you know, uh, that the U.S. Congress, Democrat and Republican and Joe Biden, you know, have given 60, 70, 80 billion dollars of arms to with the idea of, of a NATO, you know, uh, using, using Ukraine because the normal people in Ukraine are not the Azov Battalion. It's a violent minority, but it's now controlling the government. Just like in Germany, the, the, you know, the National Socialists never had a majority, you know, but, you know, once Hitler was in power with support from Western finance, what was the average person supposed to do? Well, they, they tried to function, but we call them now good Germans because they didn't resist. But I, I got to tell you, we all have to look ourselves in the mirror. What are we doing at this moment in history where the consensus is saying that you have to line up against Vladimir Putin, you know, or else there are consequences. Um, now, here's another uh, thing. 2014, same year that the coup happened. This is uh, just a statement, oh, a week ago, 
by Jen Stoltenberg, NATO General Sec Secretary today from Norway, um, Nordic blonde haired, blue eyed guy, says, quote, very, very proudly, we have been supporting Ukraine for many years. NATO allies have trained and equipped the Ukrainian forces since 2014. So do you think Putin's an idiot? He sees this happening. He knows that 25 million of his brethren, including his older brother, whom he never met, were killed by the Nazis with support from Western finance. You know, and, and here you have the, the, the second and third generation Nazis installed in Ukraine being armed to the teeth. You know, he was putting out calls for secure, you know, for, we, we, we got to do something about this. Um, now, um, uh, Tim was asking me where we get our intelligence. Uh, I am former uh, circulation manager for this publication called Executive Intelligence Review, uh, which um, LaRouche and his associates have been putting out without interruption since 1974. So I think that even beats the College of Complexes in terms of the continuity, or maybe not, I don't know, but that's a that's quite a remarkable accomplishment since, you know, LaRouche was in and out of prison. You know, they came in and padlocked the doors of all of our other publications when George Bush took control of things, Poppy Bush. But we've continued to publish EIR, and you can see the date on this one, February 7th, 2014. World War III danger, Western powers back neo-Nazi coup in Ukraine. You know, and I, I think what you see there is, is someone being um, you know, a, a protester, you know, just simply being uh, put on fire. There was another incident where a trade union group was protesting the Nazis in Odessa. They ran back into the Union Hall um, and, um, you know, and the Nazis padlocked the doors and, and burned down the whole Union Hall. You know, you had ethnic cleansing going on against the Russian speaking provinces to the uh, east. You know, in Crimea, which sits out there on a peninsula, um, you know, was the first to uh, vote overwhelmingly to, to reaffiliate with uh, Russia. What were you told? Putin invaded Ukraine. That's what you were told. The fact that the Nazis killed 14,000 people over the course of eight years. Was that covered in the Western press? I don't recall it ever being seen, but it was covered in an executive intelligence review. Um, Tim was asking where we get our intelligence. This is one of my dear friends. Her name is Natalia Vitrenko. She's a very courageous lady who's a, who, who um, we brought to the United States and put on tour during the formative period uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and all of that. She had her own party in Ukraine. It was called the Progressive Socialist Party. She, uh, she was a member of the Rada, their parliament, uh, for, for many years. She ran for president, got 11% of the vote. This is one of the rallies you can see, Stop NATO. And um, she, 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 she had her differences with the communists, but she was emphatic against the looting and plundering of Ukraine by the Western corporations. And her party has been banned by Vladimir Zelensky, okay? They took it up to the Supreme Court, it was thrown out. Every single opposition party has been banned all the opposition newspapers and television stations have been shut down. Um, but she's still there because Ukraine is her country and she loves it. And she, and she says, history will vindicate us. And I, and I, I wholeheartedly um, am dedicated that history uh, will um, vindicate courageous people like Natalia. Um, now, did it really come to the big nu nuclear showdown, though, uh, under Obama that the London Economist was projecting? Well, no, not quite. And a part of it was because of an intervention by Angela Merkel, who despite all of, you know, shortcomings, nonetheless, uh, initiated something in concert with uh, the government of France to cool things down. And th there was kind of a status quo established called the Minsk Accords. The Minsk Accords uh, were Germany, France, Ukraine, and Russia. There were agreements to um, to allow the eastern provinces to um, continue to speak Russian uh, because the Azovs were trying to ban you know, Russian and only have Ukrainian language. Even though they're close, there are differences. Um, so uh, this, and, and Putin 
was willing to accept that. He says, yes, yes, let's, but the, the Azov types, no. The, the shelling continued and, and unfortunately, probably with pressure from the U.S. State Department and, uh, and, and Whitehall, um, um, the Minsk Accords were never really strenuously enforced, but it did maintain a certain kind of a, a kind of a quasi-stability st for a period. Um, but the ethnic cleansing, the, the shellings never stopped. Um, and, uh, you know, this is just one, you know, this, this was just normal, you know, of what was going on uh, of the shelling of the civilian population centers in the east. And it was barely covered in the west. Just like I remember during the Reagan presidency, you had the Iran-Iraq war that went on for seven years. Millions of people were killed. The U.S. was arming both sides right you know overtly arming saddam covertly arming khomeini through oliver north and bush and all that iran contra but we we barely we you know these wars just function out of the corner of our eye and we go out and, and live our lives then you had this fellow here oh yes you know vladimir Zelensky. he's jewish how could he support neo-nazis well you know like like in the picture with the disciples oh we're all abraham you know, children of Abraham. I think Jesus said at one point, look, my father could take these rocks and turn them into ch children of Abraham. You know, what's in your heart? Well, here he is, oh, looking so serious at the Munich Security Conference, you know, in early uh, January of this year. You know what he was doing? He was asking um, for nuclear weapons. He says, um, Ukraine needs to be armed with nuclear weapons. You need to give us nuclear weapons, right? So that's what he said, his, his a serious demeanor. What's he really thinking? Oh, there he is. Oh, yes, Vladimir Zelensky, the comedian, the movie actor, the uh, egotist, the narcissist, right? Strutting his stuff on YouTube. You can look this up yourself. But he's at the, um, you know, but, but he, he's been the darling of the Western, um, you know, media, the Western financiers. He's their boy for NATO to go and vanquish and crush Russia. And here he is at the Munich conference demanding nuclear weapons. Now that's the context that Putin moved in in February of this year. Because his, you know, he, he's, a, he's a Russian patriot. You know, he knows, he knows the history of, of the Nazis, you know, and, and his nation. And, uh, he was, and all of his appeals to deal with this Nazi problem in Ukraine were falling on deaf ears. Okay. Now, on the question of nuclear weapons... Do I have to remind everyone that the U.S. is the only power that has ever used nuclear weapons in a war situation? What you see here is the remnants of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, who were both civilian population centers. There was no military significance at all to either of these cities, right? But, you know, but it was with Truman in close consultation with Winston Churchill, that we're going to call the shots in the post-war world when this happened. And so let me go back to the Obama period again. You know, um, something, a new security doctrine was introduced under Obama. You've probably heard of MAD before, the Mutual Unassured Destruction. You know, if there's a nuclear war, we all get blown away and that's the end of it. So you, you deal with it with something called deterrence, where each side has a... Uh, um, you know, a devastating second strike capability. And it's a terrible situation to be living in. And by the way, yesterday, or maybe today, is the uh, 60 year anniversary of the culmination of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I remember from second grade when we were all hovering under our desks waiting for the bombs to drop. But in 2007, 2008, uh, the, the doctrine changed to something from uh, away from mutual assured destruction to something called prompt global strike, which is that official U.S. policy is that you can actually launch a first strike with hypersonic weapons and win with acceptable losses. Okay, and that that was a policy that was adopted under Obama, maintained under Trump. That is official policy now. And by the fact that the U.S. put that out there, that we're going to develop these hypersonic weapons and win World War III, well, what, what was the result there? Well, both Russia and China said, well, we better build some hypersonic weapons. And hypersonic means five times the speed of sound, okay? You know, as opposed to supersonic, which is just, you know, 
you know, twice the speed of sound. So, 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 but let's, let's look um, at a, you know, once again, the long view here, a fellow named Bertrand Russell, who's really at the crusty core of what empire policy is in terms of his thoughts, his, you know, his writings. And he wrote this, I think, in 19, uh, yeah, September of 1945. Remember, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was in August of 1945. So what's old Dirty Birdie say? There is one thing and one thing only that will save the world, and that is a thing I should not dream of advocating, and that is that America should make war on Russia in, during the next two years and establish a world empire by means of the atomic bomb. Now, yeah, uh, I should not dream of advocating. I guarantee you he advocated this all over the place you know, in the Bulletin uh, of Atomic Scientists, in front of the Royal Society and so forth, you know, urging, urging Truman to, to launch a preemptive strike against Russia before they themselves got the bomb. Well, he didn't get his wisp, but that's been the, um, the obsession, you know, of the one-worlders around the oligarchy, you know, is that Russia must be, you know, crushed. So this, there's a long history to this. And so now we have, uh, you know, NATO, this super, uh, um, you know, force, which should have gone out of business in 1991 with the fall of the Berlin Wall, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. NATO's getting bigger, you know, um, um, like Sweden and Finland and all their way in, despite the fact that there were 200,000 people in Sweden protesting, you know, we don't want to be part of NATO. They're going in just by fiat. You know, and, and NATO was in Afghanistan, and I got news, their plan is to go into Taiwan and turn Taiwan into an offensive um, uh, uh, launching base for nuclear weapons aimed at China. So in the middle of all of this, you know, does everyone, you know, go along with this? Well, obviously not. You know, there, there is opposition to this, but that's where this question of, of truth comes in. What you're what here is that the UN General Assembly um, her, uh, this is the Prime Minister of New Zealand, whose name is uh, Jacinda Ardem, uh, and she calls on the world community um, basically to have the UN function as a global cop to, to tell us what's true and what's not. And of course, is New Zealand a very important country? Well, yes, it is part of what's called the Five Eyes intelligence sharing, um, which is part of the special relationship where the UK um, the USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, those five nations, you know, the white people, right, share all their intelligence with each other in terms of how the world is to be, to be uh, run. But I want to talk specifically um, now as to what, what, the, what I, the subtopic of this is. There is an entity that my movement has come directly up against called the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation, right? Um, which um, uh, it was set up by NATO on the, on the model of the UK's Integrity Initiative and the recently announced US Department of Homeland Security Disinformation Governance Board to censure any truths about the NATO war on Russia or about the Nazi forces with, within Ukraine. On May 28, it launched a frontal assault on Helga Sepp-LaRouche, the founder of the Schiller Institute, and on, on uh, two American patriots who spoke at the May 26, 2022 um, Schiller Institute conference. Okay, um, the CCD, which functions out of President Zelensky's National Security and Defense Council, um, uh, should be shut down, and that's the hypothesis of this uh, this this conversation because you're paying for this guys you are paying for this with your tax dollars you know through various uh, non-government organizations uh, through the US State Department and other Western entities is paying for a um, um, an outfit uh, whose purpose is to target uh, as information terrorists and war criminals anyone that opposes the NATO narrative on Ukraine. And that is a quote um, uh, 
from uh, their president at their July meeting, whose name is Andriy Shapovalov, right? That people that oppose, you know, that are for peace are thereby branded as Putin puppets, you know, and have to be silenced and, and, and treated as information terrorists or war criminals. So, um, and, and this I think is their, um, one of their publications they put out, Stop Info Terror. I can't read the Ukrainian, but there it is. Um, so who shows up on the list? Well, first of all, we didn't know about this until they targeted us, but I'll get back to that. Uh, among the people uh, um, targeted are Tulsi Gabbard, who recently, you know, uh, made headlines for quitting the Democratic Party. You know, she was a, a, she was seen as a leading light in the Democratic Party. And of course, she was an Iraqi war vet herself, but became not, you know, but but then knows more brutally than a lot of people that have never served the, the reality of these wars and become a, a real spokesman against the wars. So she was on the target list. You might recognize Glenn Greenwald there, investigative journalist, uh, who, um, among other things, uh, was the individual that uh, courageously uh, published Ed Snowden's revelations. Scott Ritter. Scott Ritter um, was um, um, a Marine, then became UN weapons inspector and, and, and took issue with all the scare stories about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that were used to oper um, justify Operation Iraqi Freedom. And then also Colonel Douglas McGregor, uh, who um, is another outspoken veteran against the NATO expansion. Um, you have the, the strange case of uh, Senator uh, Rand Paul from Kentucky, Republican, whose main problem, as far as I, I see it, with um, is that he, he just asked, asked um, uh, Senate uh, Chuck Schumer, where's all the money going? We're giving huge amounts of money to Ukraine, a very unsettled situation. We've got problems at home. Don't we need some accounting, um, you know, as to where the money is being spent? Chuck Schumer says, I am insulted that the junior senator from Kentucky, you know, would challenge the great de Democratic freedom fighters and, and so forth. So Rand Paul got put on the hit list by the um, Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation. But the top 30 names of the list are all members of the Schiller Institute, of which I have been a proud member of since 1984 when it was founded. And uh, what you see here is a montage from one of our recent um, um, uh, online forums, Ray McGovern. He's, he was one of the founders of um, the Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, former CIA analyst who's taking, taken issues with the wars, uh, Graham Fuller on the far right, um, Senator Richard Black on the lower left, um, Jim Jatris, uh, Jeff Young, who is the Democratic um, nominee for Congress in, in one of the districts in Kentucky, uh, who in his flyers that he got out to defeat the other Democrat and also assailing his Republican opponent, saying, I would not send weapons to neo-Nazis in Ukraine, and he won. So he'll, he'll be, you know, in, in 10 days uh, in a contest for who holds that seat. And then on top middle is uh, someone that I know personally, Diane Sayre, who is um, the independent candidate um, for U.S. Senate to challenge Chuck Schumer in New York. She's on the ballot. She got um, 66,000 signatures of independent-minded uh, New Yorkers, voters, to put her on the ballot. I'll talk about her more later. But uh, top of the list is Helga Zepp LaRouche, who is Lyndon LaRouche's widow. LaRouche died in 2019. God rest his soul. Lower right is uh, Jacques Cheminade, who leads our, our organization in France. Jacques has uh, run for president three times, which is no small undertaking over there, and has been calling for France to do what Charles de Gaulle did. Charles de Gaulle actually pulled France out of NATO for a period of time in, in the 60s because he didn't trust them. And then on the lower left is Harley Schlanger, who I also know quite well. He used to uh, head our movement's activities here in Houston. He actually ran for U.S. Senate in Texas and got a quarter million votes from Democrats to challenge uh, Phil Graham 
um, I think it was in 1990. So they're very high up on the hit list. All right, could uh, you wrap it up in about 15 minutes or so so we can get the questions a little bit yeah, later? Yeah, I, I understand, but we got a late start. I'll, I'll be as no, That's as not a problem, thank you. Marat, but there, then there's a parallel list called Marat Verets, which stands for peacekeepers. How, how do you like the, those peacekeepers down there, huh? But th this, is the, this is the kill list. In other words, the Center for Countering Disinformation targets individuals. Marat Verets, you know, does the dirty work. One of the people they killed was, uh, you probably heard about Darwina Dugina, who was blown up in a car bomb. There she is. That word etched across her face is liquidated. And so, um, so the, the kill list is the people that are actually being physically targeted who have to look over their shoulder. Helga LaRouche. Uh, Ray McGovern, Tulsi Gabbard, there's Harley again with his, um, his uh, now deceased uh, uh, wife, uh, Susan Schlanger. Um, when she died, Harley left Texas and moved to Germany where he gives uh, daily commentary. And Harley, um, this is a, a, a shot from um, a Marat Verrett's uh, video with the satanic rock music saying Harley is some evil, you know, uh, analyst working for Putin. Right, so his life is at risk. Here's a picture of my wedding day. This is uh, me and my bride, uh, Elizabeth. That's my dad, my mom over on the right, Joe Cohen, my best man on the far right. But standing over there is um, Harley, who uh, gave Betty away at our wedding. So Harley, who is being targeted, is very close to me. Uh, now, so we gotta stand up to, to the speak truth to power on this. And that's what our movement is doing. You might have seen this uh, recently. My young friends, Conan Thistlewaite and uh, Jose Vega, um, showed up at a town meeting in um, uh, Bronxville, New York, of a of a oh progressive uh, uh, congresswoman named Alexandra Ocasio Cortez, and basically <laughs> laid it out there that this is just a fraud. You voted to send arms and weapons to Ukraine. Um, you know, how can you call yourself a progressive, peace-loving person? And this um, video, which maybe some of you have seen within 20, um, 48 hours, had 25 million hits. It was seen all around the world, including in Russia. They said, thank God there's a couple of Americans and young Americans that aren't, you know, goose-stepping into nuclear war with Russia. You had a, a, a thing where certain progressive Democrats uh, just last week stepped forward to, to, to send a letter to Joe Biden saying, well, shouldn't we negotiate? We have to keep a negotiating option out front. Um, uh, once again, Sheila Jackson Lee um, um, signed on. I think this is, uh, um, I know Rokana signed on. I, I can't read the name here. Paramina uh, Jayapal. But within less than 24 hours, they had withdrawn it. You know, oh, well, we didn't really mean it. You know, we stand with the Pentagon. So who knows what kind of pressure was brought on them. You had Republican Kevin McCarthy saying, well, if the Republicans, you know, win, you know, we're not going to have a blank check for Ukraine. He was blasted as a Putin puppet. I don't know if he's on the hit list, but this is the uh, climate of hysteria. This is the guy I'm, I'm coming to respect. This is a Republican congressman named Gosar from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. He says, well, if no one else is going to do it, I guess I got to do it. I offer the city of Phoenix for Putin, Zelensky, and Biden to come and negotiate peace. If I'm the only one that's going to stand for peace in the Congress, so be it. So everyone, I think, should send him a little email or letter or call of support. Um, so this is the, let, uh, the image that um, Charles put in. Charles, I don't know where. It says Newport, so maybe that's in Rhode Island. I don't know where this picture was taken. But there is a growing protest. I will say that protesting is, is not enough because you have to get at the causality of all of this. But I'm encouraged that there is some protest out there. But look over in Europe, right? In Europe, um, this is um, in a, a, a city in Eastern Europe about uh, 50 miles east of Leipzig, right? Do people remember the Leipzig demonstrations from 1989? The candlelight vigils, you know, the people that very reverently stood up, you know, in the context of the, of the um, INF uh, nuclear showdown that was underway back then. And this actually created the conditions ultimately for the peaceful 
fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany. You know, and so they, they're not accepting the bullshit as, as, as malleably as the um, Germans in the West. Um, um, so this is what you're witnessing, right? But, you know, because in Europe, you know, gas has gone up a thousand percent because of the sanctions. People cannot heat their homes. They cannot afford to feed themselves, you know, um, you know, and, uh, you know, due to the sanctions, the cutoff of the oil in the middle of these protests where they said, just lift the sanctions, get the gas flowing. We're losing our jobs. We're losing everything. Stop this war. And in the middle of this, boom, the Nord Stream pipelines were blown up. Boom. And they were just, you know, shut off. Okay. And, and, and now we're going to see what the Russians have to present when the UN Security Council meets on this. But of course, people in Europe are told, oh, no, 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 you have all these problems. You know, who, you know, whose fault is it? Yes, it's Putin. It's Putin. Yes. You know, have your 10 minute hate with Putin every day. He's the cause of all of your problems. It was like Hitler blamed the Jews for everything while he was cozying up to the Western financiers. Um, so we got to stand up for the truth on the question of the universal surveillance. You know, Ed Snowden is, is one of my heroes that I think should get the Nobel Peace Prize. But here's a lady that really stands up for the truth. And I am drawing to a conclusion here soon. This is Diane Sayre confronting um, Chuck Schumer, I think before she had officially declared on his support for every war. Okay, the most powerful man in the US Senate. Now she is on the ballot in New York State. There's supposed to be a, you know, 66,000 signatures she got of people that enthusiastically wanted an independent voice in Congress. There's going to be a debate tomorrow in New York. Sponsor, I think Syracuse, sponsored by Spectrum News. She is not invited to the debate. There's Chuck Schumer and a Republican named Joe Pinion, whom we call No Pinion because he's just a milk toast, nothing. But the only woman is disallowed. That's going to be interesting. So keep an eye on that. See what happens tomorrow. This is uh, Diane victoriously um, turning in her signatures. I'll tell you, I personally got a couple of thousand of them. I went up to New York for three weeks in May. There's one of her billboards in Brooklyn, U.S. out of NATO, Dump Schumer, vote Diane Sayre, November 8th. She's getting great support, but as uh, Senator uh, Richard Black said when he wrote to the Spectrum News Service, you're turning New York into Mississippi on the Hudson if you keep Diane Sayre out. Why is Schumer supporting Nazis in Ukraine? This is a rally on the streets of Manhattan. And quickly, why is it happening? Why are the Western elites so obsessed with crushing Russia and China? Because their financial system is coming down. You know, we were supposed to dominate the world under the rules-based order. Well, the dollar is, is, you know, the interest rates are going up every few weeks now to try to prop up the dollar and quote unquote fight inflation. But um, as soon as this uh, election stuff is out of the way, I predict the floodgates are going to really open up on the hyperinflationary crash engulfing the Western financiers. I mean, look what just happened with Liz Truss. Go, come and gone in 44 days, you know. The last thing the Queen did before she shuffled off to her infernal reward, right? Liz Truss comes in. She's going to be the new Margaret Thatcher. She went with quantitative easing, then belt tightening, then quantitative easing again. None of it worked. She's gone. And now you have a guy named Rishi Sunak has been brought in as the new prime minister. Did anybody vote for him? Where's all this democracy talk, right? There's no democracy over there. You have a, a monarch, a house of lords, and the, the pre, you know the prime minister is appointed in a back room. Uh, but there is a new uh, direction of things in the world, um, which my movement has helped bring into existence, a new combination of nations to find a new means for world development and consistent with what America ought to be doing in the world, the unfulfilled dream of Franklin Roosevelt toward world development. That's what I'm committed to. We should not be some darn empire policing the world through NATO. We should have a peace through development approach toward our foreign policy. You know, um, once again, looking back at the Cuban Missile Crisis 60 years ago, thank God we had a president who was willing to talk. Despite all the Cold War rhetoric, there was a back channel of Kennedy appealing to the humanity and Khrushchev and vice versa. And we worked our way through this thing. Is that is there a, a Kennedy on the horizon today? I can guarantee you it's not Joe Biden. 
So we have to be that front channel. Um, this is um, from a, a Schiller Institute conference that just happened last week on peace through development that was actually uh, aired from the Chamber of Deputies in Mexico City. This is a former congresswoman named uh, Los Angeles uh, Huerta who um, you know got the room for us. And so there were, um, there were seven uh, nations represented. So we're galvanizing nations to the south as well as in Africa to stand up. That's Helga, Peace Through Development. And once again, um, going back to that picture of the Marat Verets calling themselves the peacemakers, no. There, you know, there's a saying in, in, in the book of Matthew now, blessed are the peacemakers, so they shall be called the children of God. So, you know, that's what we have to be, um, you know, despite everything and take all the flack because uh, I submit that we do have truth on our side and the truth ultimately, if we're courageous, will um, overpower all the false narratives. So that's what I have to say. I can, that's my class. I, I can provide more documentation if you wish. But I thank you for your time, and I will be happy to entertain questions. Thank you. I'm going to unshare your screen, if you don't mind, and uh, we'll uh, go with our questions and answers. So uh, So I don't have to do anything, right? I should just sit tight and not touch anything, right? Because I don't want to screw right, anything right. up. Okay, because, good. Because right now, you could, we can see you pretty well, and uh, what we're going to do is bring questions. Okay. Let's thank our speaker first. And before we get into questions, I just want to ask uh, how you got involved a little bit, Joe, with the uh, LaRouche movement and... Uh, were you, are you, uh, I know you were actively working for them for a while, and are you working with a retirement from them too as well, or are you still? No, well, first of all, I never worked for them. I always had a job. I retired from my job. I'm now 67, right? But I was working graveyard shift work here in Houston, doing security at a pipeline firm. Okay. Um, there was a period in the 80s where I guess we were raising enough wherewithal to have a, a, a brief period where I, I did subsist on a stipend but that that all went down with the legal attacks on our movement which were quite vicious you know and as i'm sure you know larouche himself went to prison for five yeah, years uh, I'm, uh, I'm aware of that I, but uh, in answer to your question how i got involved i, I look i'm i i'm in um i'm a native of maryland i went to the university of maryland and uh, I, I like to consider myself a creative human being. And the career path I was on uh, was um, theater, lights and sound in particular, you know, um, on the, and, but you know, but like classical theater. Uh, and uh, the, I uh, ended up in New York. Is, is everything okay? Yeah. yeah, it is. It's just, uh, it, it is. Just go ahead and keep going. Anyway, um, in uh, set, um, in uh, October of 1975, um, which was when New York was forced into default by Felix Rohatton. You know, the whole city was forced into bankruptcy, you know, and soon after that, you know, um, the, the, the trash started piling up, rats started, you know, infesting the street, you know, uh, you, know every, you know, real social breakdown, uh, and I began to wonder about things. And then, um, in my first presidential election in 76, even though I consider myself a Democrat, I voted for Jerry Ford because I didn't really trust Jimmy Carter. And his victory was something of a shock. And it was after that. And I, I was beginning to say, I really don't want to do this theater thing. It's too weird. It's too degenerate. And I picked up a newspaper at the University of Maryland in December of 1976 called New Solidarity back then. And I, and I said, holy shit, this is serious. I better look at the real world and and then i went to their their conference in new york and basically by the time i graduated in june of that year i decided to, to just chuck the whole theater thing and uh, fill my lot in with the larouche movement okay i was just curious all right uh lana and dan you got the first question so unmute and go ahead and ask okay i i like your talk mr jennings uh Okay, do you know about the civil war in Ukraine from 1918 to 1921? Um, probably not as much as I should. Um, and are, are you on a phone? It would be neat if I could actually see you. Uh, maybe not. Um, no, go ahead and tell uh, me about it. 
Tell me about okay. it. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little bit. It was it, basically it was a civil war with uh, Bolsheviks, with uh, Ukrainian nationalists, and with people from Poland, Germany, and uh, Romania, all fighting each other. And during that same time, there were 100,000 Jews that were killed in pogroms. Maybe you heard about pogroms at some point. Well, time. I did, but I hadn't heard about that. No, I, I, I yeah. talked to you about 1941, but okay. No, but it, no, this is before the Holocaust. Uh -huh. Anyway, so, I mean, this is a, don't you think that this is almost a civil war now going on from 2014 to, to now? It's just repeating history is repeating itself from 100 years ago. It's a civil war. Well, also, of course, before all that, there was something called the Crimean War, which I think was back in the 1840s, right? Um, so Ukraine, because, you know, the, you've got religious and ethnic divides but also a very resource rich area and very, you know, geostrategically located has always been a, a battleground between powers larger than itself. And of course, I don't believe in any inevitability of history, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 the philosophy of the Schiller Institute is peace through development. Okay. Peace through development. Yes. That that if you bring, if you if you dedicate a nation to a grand project, in which everyone can be enriched, right? You know, through mutual participation, <laughs> they, then they can get over all their racial hangups and, and so forth. Right. Kind right. of like what uh, FDR did in the Tennessee Valley. It wasn't as if FDR was not aware of the Klan and racism and all the problems down there, but um, you know he. He, he succeeded in doing what Abraham Lincoln did not do, because Abraham Lincoln had grand plans for reconstruction in the South, but he was assassinated, you know, and the carpetbaggers moved in. So um, we've we've done all sorts of studies on how Ukraine could become a, a, a great hub of commerce between East and West. Um, they used to have a great air, you know, space capability, nuclear energy, they got uranium, but a lot of it's just been stolen from them by the Western, um, you know, the, the right. first the shock therapy and then the, and then the deregulation that kicked in after the Orange Revolution. Right. Uh, the, the Ukrainian uh, constitution in 1918 or 1919, it was written in Yiddish, Russian, Ukrainian, and Polish. So, I mean, they acknowledge that there were a lot of different ethnic groups in the country. And uh, then the West came in. All right. Anyways, that's. Thank yeah, you. no, I'll have to look that up. I mean, if, if you can recommend me to. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to study history to figure this uh, stuff out. Je Jeffrey Veit Veitlinger. He okay. wrote the book In the Midst of Europe. In the Midst of Europe. It's about, yeah, that's about the Ukrainian war. Thank you. Okay. You're uh, welcome. Thank you. Tim, Tim, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Charlie. Next questioner. Yeah, I said go ahead. Oh, I didn't hear. Yeah, I okay, said go ahead. Uh, Why don't you put your video on, Charlie? It's on. No, there you no, are. Now, 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 you're, now you're there. Yeah, so I could show my hand for a question, but I didn't hear anything. We, we All right, so... You seem to have made the assertion that there were any number of Nazis in Russia, and you cited an instance from World War II. But to my knowledge, despite the millions of, geez, must be mil, million and a half to two and a half million prisoners taken by the German army, only about 200,000 people guys volunteered to serve as in the German army and they were in a non-combat situation. They were basically a little better living conditions and used primarily as like slave labor. 
they would not indicate to me that there is there was during World War II any significant uh, move presence of Nazis within Russia. Well, what do you mean? Are you saying and uh, you mean native Nazis or you know about Operation Barbarossa? And were, and you were basically making a case that there was a Nazi indigenous. Nazi no, 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 that's not what I said. You cited the instance, which no, that we're claiming it was done by Russian Nazis. No, no, I didn't you say that at several all. times about Russian Nazis. No, I'm talking about, talk about Ukrainian. No, I talked about Ukrainian Nazis. And right? throughout Russia. No, in that's totality, not... there were no presence of Nazis. Moving, Charles, became... Charles, you and I, you and I agree on that. And I and I am interested in your class on November the twelfth. I think that sounds. Well, if there like were that. no Nazis in Russia during the World War Two. Well, the, they came after the war. No, the Nazis that went into Russia are the ones that invaded Russia from the west. Operation Barbarossa, right? They went in and rolled in, and you know, and 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 uh, they and um, Stalin had um, the in forces. Fact, Leningrad. Yeah, Leningrad and, and, and moving toward Moscow. Russians attack Leningrad? No, Nazis attack Leningrad. Yes, and, and Putin's uh, mother was almost killed. She was pulled out of a body of corpses in Leningrad by the guy that later married her. You know, yes, this is a very, they, they call it the Great Patriotic War. The, the you know, the, um, the, the, uh, so there were no not were there Nazis in Russia or not? The only Nazis were in Russia were the ones that came in from Germany. Somehow so there you, were Russians who from Germany who joined the the, the no the no you got it all mixed up and invaded Russia. The German Nazis German invaded Army. Russia. Yes, the Germ and you know what that all all of the um, for example you've heard of the. Um, uh, everyone knows about the Munich sellout, of course, right? You know, with Neville Chamberlain. Um, oh, Czechoslovakia is a faraway land of which we know little. You know, and Czech Czechoslovakia was basically thrown to the wolves. And now, wh why was that? I was always told that it was because of the uh, resources of Sudetenland. But you just look at the map there. Of course, today is Czech Republic and Slovak Republic. But then it was a long, skinny country running from uh, west to east, which once it was neutralized, then uh, it was a very straight march from the, the German Nazis through Ukraine directly into Russia. And, um, and um, the, it was, and, and so there was a whole series of sellouts and appeasements on the part of the West because they saw Hitler as their anti-communist geopolitical, you know, asset, just like um, NATO sees Ukraine as their asset against Russia today. And um, my movement is very, very well known in Russia. In fact, Lyndon LaRouche, um, while he was in prison, was inducted into the Russian Academy of Sciences as an associate member um, um, by a professor who was part Ukrainian and part Russian named Taras Morinsky, based on his economic writings that gave Russia a handle to fight back against the shock therapy. You know, work on- Follow up question. Yes, sir. Brief one. Three and a half million Germans on June 22nd, 1941, invaded Russia. How many of those in the German army were Russians? I don't think any of them were Russian. They were all German, right? Well, then there was no Nazi presence in Russia. I think you're. I think you're confusing. I never said there was. Jacob has a question. Can we ask? See what Jacob has. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we can move on. All right, Jacob, you're up next. Uh, if you want to show yourself, please do. Unmute, please. You got to unmute, Jacob. Thanks. I'll lower your hand. Hello. Oh, there you are. Hey, how are you, you Jacob? Sir? Go ahead. Yeah, anybody who's well informed already knows what he's saying. It's very common knowledge amongst those that are well informed. So it's nothing new. Uh, if we study 
if, especially if you're a student of history and you've been studying history for the past decades, right? So <clears throat> the question is, what are we doing about it? How do we get rid of these corrupt politicians that are now acting as puppets for the plutocratic families who are creating such havoc in the world, right? For decades now, killing, murdering millions and millions of people, making them homeless, creating psychological damage to millions and millions of people, right? All right, all right. We have to, we have, to have a strategy. What is your strategy? Okay, but right? I, okay. What is your plan of action yeah. to do this, to replace those politicians, all 453 of them or so, right, in the Congress, in the presidency? Well, okay, once again, think At about- At least two thirds of them. Thank, thank you. Think, and think about what I said, for example, around the progressive caucus people, you know, who, who did the right thing in signing that uh, letter to uh, Pompeo back during the, the Trump period and more recently coming out of, with a very timid, um, you know, uh, admonition to President Biden that we have to negotiate. And then they retracted. Now, somebody put the screws on them. Right, as as uh, as as uh, Chuck Schumer said to Rachel Maddow, just as the whole thing around Trump and Putin and stuff was getting underway, he, um, Schumer says, "Oh yeah, well you can, you you can't challenge the intelligence services. They have ten ways right. of Sunday to get back at you." Okay, right. well now that's getting better. It, yeah, the, the yeah you can fault the politicians for being weak. But they're, they're not weak. running the sh they're shut running the show. I know they're puppets. Okay. So, so how do we so, replace okay, these so the puppets? In, in, intelligence services. Well, you know, one thing we can do is run against them, and that's I'm I'm actually coordinating a campaign down here in Houston of Joel DeJean, who's running. But I always tell people to but I'm not run talk as a Democrat about that. No, so no, that they no, win no. in the primary okay. and go on to the general. You have to. So I I support uh, what the lady in New York is doing, is yeah. running. She's running as a Democrat in the primary. Who, so, who, uh, but I haven't decided if I'm going to, I mean, basically it's a protest vote against Schumer. No, Diane, uh, Schumer. D Diane Sarah is running as an independent. Yeah, Diane uh, Sarah is, but I haven't decided yeah. if my voting block is going to support her or just write in uh, Howie well, Hawkins. Well, I would say, on that, I would suggest you just go to her website and start looking at it. It's called no, Sarah I already have. I already know everything okay, about great. her. Yeah. Well, I don't I, like her position on uh, entheogens. I think they're is that okay. true that she's okay. against uh, well, well, legalizing? In, in, answer, in answer to your question, Jacob, okay. No, I'm asking you a question. Is it true that she is against legal, legalization of antigens? I don't even know what an antigen is. Let's uh, marijuana, uh, mushrooms, etc. Yeah, she's against that. She's against that, yeah. Yeah. Um, We're I mean, more that, libertarian in that way. Well, another ideologue, um, Aldous Huxley, you know, whose brother Julian was an arch race uh, theorist. Um, Aldous Huxley said, um, we will make them uh, love their chains. We will make them slaves and they will love their chains, right? So if you've read Brave New World and Soma and all of that, you know, it was this how you use drugs to subdue people as the British also did in China no. with the opium wars and so forth. Just but, but the but Jake, mushrooms but, have the opposite effect. Oh, oh, okay. They break the chains. <laughs> Okay, they uh, break but, the conditioning but, but, but program. Do you, want, do you want an answer to your question? That's what I'm asking. I'm, I'm proposing, right? You have to look above. You already answered it. No, I didn't. Oh, I didn't. oh, you mean a proposal, the plan of action? Yes. What to yes. Do. yes. Go ahead. You know, um, that that in my mind, nations, right? See, nations are a new phenomenon in the world. They've only been around since the Peace of Westphalia. You know, sixteen, but. But the plutocrats and so forth, they go back to Babylon and so forth, right? And they hide behind all these mythologies of free market this and free market that, which which you play that game, it's appealing to your greed, right? Just get rid of all the rules and regulations and you'll get rich. Well, no, the, 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 there's nothing free about the markets. And what's going to have to happen is that uh, you have to have an agreement nation to nation to put this mess through chapter 11 reorganization, okay? To basically say these debts cannot be paid, you know, we're gonna have, every nation is gonna have its own version of Glass-Steagall, and if you don't like it, you can lump it, you know, but we're not gonna come to the rescue of the financial markets through austerity, okay? 
So what you, you see right now with the U.S. using its privileged uh, position in the world by the fact that the dollar's been the world reserve currency, albeit not plugged into anything since Richard Nixon. So we're sanctioning people here. We're sanctioning people there. We, you know, we stole all the money from Afghanistan when we pulled out. Stealing money from Russia, right? <clears throat> So nations are beginning to dump the dollar. You know, China is not. No, but the thing it. is, what is your plan of action? Okay, okay. In other words, how do we get into positions okay. of power we, we, so that we, we can implement the solutions you're well, talking we, about? You call it the new Bretton Woods, but I will tell you, um, um, Jacob. Every day, my movement, you know, is, is, is. You saw the thing with the Mexico thing that just happened this week in the Chamber of Deputies in Mexico. We're moving nations in co combination with each other to say, fuck you, you know, to the private financiers, and they're going to find, they're finding independent ways of financing and development independent of the dollar. Now, we don't want a world where the U.S. is some ogre, you know, um, you know, and then you have this other area that's moving along. We believe that America's historic mission, since we were founded in revolution against the British Empire, should be that we'd be a hell of a lot happier working with Russia and China than threatening them with nuclear war. But it's very tricky because this this week NATO and Russia were having nuclear exercises at the same time. Something goes wrong, you could have Armageddon real quick. But that's what that's ultimately the solution, and there's no guarantees. Okay. The money's, okay. So All right, let's got, move on. Um, I, I, anything else that you, I know you guys been at it for No, quite I a wanted while. to say that. Okay, thank you. I mean, because the average person, the average citizen Jacob. wants to know okay, what I'll, is the I'll, most Jacob, effective Jacob, way. We're going to go, go to that in the rebuttal period, okay, if you want to do it. Oh, I thought this chance. was it. Okay. You this got is a, question and answers. Now, uh, the next one we got, I think that's Jake in the caller there. Okay, Jake, is that you in the call? Our guy on the phone who just had his hand up. Yeah, what, 1847 or something. Yeah, uh, go ahead. You're you're on the air. Yeah. Uh, you, you say so. You talk. You talk about. You talk about. Talk about neo Nazis in in Ukraine. Approximately how many? How many of them are there? And uh, never mind the fact that uh, Zelensky himself is Jewish. So that, you know, uh, how many how many neo Nazis could there be there? Um. Well, I can't give you a number, but I think. You might be talking a very well financed eight to ten percent or something like that. Um, there's only about there's only about one percent there's only about one percent of the country that's neo Nazi. There there was a neo Nazi brigade in Ukraine, but they're very small. Um, well, well, as, what as, else I, you... as I told you, um, Vicky Nolan. These were the networks, and I don't know what were what, what if your numbers. Right. I I think it's bigger than you say, but this was the element that, um, you know, the West trafficked five billion dollars to five billion dollars to, to find to to take charge of what was economic unrest and turn it toward the overthrow of the Yanukovych government in 2014, and after that it didn't matter, you know. The, the, the neo Nazis were in the driver's seat and they controlled the law enforcement. And You're saying there was a there, this 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 was a civil war. No, I'm saying that you had a operation run from the West, Western finance, plan long out. Think about my class, please. You know how I began it with that London Economist scenario from 2007 yeah. to take control of Ukraine with Obama as president and um, bring Ukraine into NATO and to have a nuclear showdown with Russia. Okay. Right. By and the way, NATO, I, yeah. can, I, can I say something that just happened yeah. today? Yeah. Um, Barack Obama spoke at a place called Renaissance High School in Detroit. Yeah. This was a rally for the Democrats. Um, yeah. And my friends Stuart and Anastasia Battle showed up and um, told the truth. And Obama what was the truth? is that he, what? that Obama was the point person for the overthrow of the Ukrainian government in 2014 to bring these Nazis into power and to go to uh, war against Russia. 
and Obama. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say, I just want to say in response, uh, do you, are, are you familiar with Deborah Lipstadt? No. She is, uh, she was featured, uh, she was, um, she's an expert in anti-Semitism. She was appointed by Biden as his point person to deal with issues of anti-Semitism. She was questioned about that, and her response was, there's someone, uh, either, a, either a Russian general or someone close to Putin, who was quoted as saying that Hitler was half Jewish. Which is uh, which is uh, another way of saying that the Holocaust didn't really happen; the Jews did it to themselves. So the point is, is Putin Putin is accusing uh, Ukrainians of uh, of uh, uh, of harboring harboring neo Nazis when he himself is is, is being is, he himself is surrounded. Putin himself is surrounded by some some blatant anti Semites. I find it very hypocritical. Okay. Adel, 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 Adel Khan, or Adelion. And... Okay. Uh, Jake, are you done with your point now, I take it? Uh, so, for the moment. I'll be, I'll be back. I'll be I'm back. Gonna, all right. I want to move on. I'm going to mute you real quick, okay? All right. Ad, Adelion, unmute. You got, the, you got the floor. You got the next question. Is that Adelion? Alan Delion. For, for Alan. some reason, first initial, last name. Okay. Ah. Oh, ah, De Leon. Okay, yes. good. Okay. Um, so, I generally agree with pretty much everything you said. Uh, America causes all the issues in the world that later on comes back to bite us in the ass. But my thing is, it takes two to tangle. The reason why the entire world is pretty much ready to uh, fight to the death against Russia is because Putin is a straight up warmonger. From 99 in Crimea up to 2008 in South Ossieta to Ukraine recently, 2014 and now now, Putin looks like an, like an aggressor. If you want peace, how do you combat that impression that he has in the world? Thank you. Well, um, frankly, I think Putin has been a very, very very uh, uh, strong, but but at the same time, level-headed in, individual in all of this. Uh, you talk about South Ossetia. You for, you didn't mention Chechnya, right? Um, uh, you have had many operations afoot um, to basically tear Russia apart. Once again, I helped, my movement was very much at the center of the process that brought down communism, okay? Um, and I didn't talk about that tonight, but um, LaRouche uh, was uh, part of the better element of the Ronald Reagan National Security Team and was the emissary to Russia to rewrite the ABM Treaty around a, a peaceful cooperation to avoid nuclear war, called, which late, uh, now um, the com you know, the scientists over there loved it, the communists and the KGB opposed it, and LaRouche said, if you don't accept Reagan's generous offer of cooperation, your empire will fall within five years. It did happen, but by the time it fell, LaRouche was in federal prison. Okay, now, during the 1990s, uh, Mr. De Leon, uh, Russia went a, a, a demographic horror show under the shock therapy policy brought in by the Western liberal financiers, you know, Goldman Sachs and the rest of them. They just went in and, and said, you know, this is going to cause pain and suffering and sacrifice shock therapy, but don't worry, things will get better. Didn't happen. Um, and, and so you had massive looting of Russia from the West. At the same time, secessionist operations set in motion from the West around Chechnya and South Ossetia and others. And, um, and Yeltsin was just a corrupt drunk that took all the advice dished out to him from the West, but he basically bailed out at a certain point and, and, and Putin was brought in. Now Putin's right-hand man in all this 
on the economic pushback against shock therapy was a guy named Sergei Glaziev. You can look it up, G-L-A-Z-Y-E-V, who um, put out a book on the 1990s called Genocide, which is well worth reading. And he just gave a beautiful glowing tribute to LaRouche on the occasion of his 100th birthday, you know, which was this last September 8th. But Putin is not, Putin is a, is a tough leader, but he is loved in Russia, you know, because he saved his nation from absolute destruction at the hands of the Western financiers. And he's offering even at this moment, you know, uh, cooperation, you know, that they just uh, put forward a proposal to keep the space station up there, you know, uh, because Russia has to be part of that space station in terms of the propulsion rocket that, that keep it in orbit, you know, that's, that, that those are not technologies that America does. Russia does that. And he could cut it off and the space station would crash into the ocean, but he's still handing out the, the, the olive branch of cooperation, but he's not a pussy. You know, he's not, he's, he, he knows damn well what he's up against in Ukraine. You know, is a, is a Nazi capability finance from the West. And then, and, and, and any fantasies that the West has that they're going to crush and destroy Russia and then move on to crush and destroy China ain't going to happen. They'll go to thermonuclear war first. Okay, uh, Charlie, I'm, I know you got your hand up, but I want to get this other caller in first. The 774-2935. Uh, I don't know who that is, but uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. And then I'll go to Charlie. All right. Uh, the person who has got phone. Okay. You, you, Hello, can, you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is that you, Jake, again? Yeah. Uh, Unless you're calling somebody else. Are you calling us somebody else? Well, I'll let Charlie go next then, okay? Okay. I, thought, I thought it was another caller coming in. You've already had your question, Jake. All right, Charlie, okay. go ahead. I'm mute, Charlie. Yeah, Mr. Jennings, uh, 30 countries have elected to join NATO. Uh, many of them former republics of, of the Soviet Union, Poland, Lithuania, uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, even Bulgaria, uh, and about the only countries that haven't joined NATO are, are in the Pacific, like Japan and Australia, which I don't know why they ever would, but there seems to be some movement towards joining NATO, and there doesn't seem appear to be any movement to joining Russia. Have any countries joined Russia after the dissolution of the Soviet Union? Is that your question? Yeah, I, I, you're, you're positing that well, I, 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 mean, I, I, the, the, the Ukraine actually wants to join Russia, right? No, that's not what I'm positing at all. Well, what do they all, want? I'm saying, saying that the eastern provinces, uh, the Russian-speaking provinces of the east of Ukraine, Donetsk and Lugansk, um, also, uh, Odessa, although there's a separation there, you know, the majority ethnic Russian speaking, yeah, I mean, after eight years of ethnic cleansing and attacks from the Nazis, yeah, I was saying we want out of here. But no, there's no moving, there's no... There's ethnic cleansing by Nazis in, 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 in the Ukraine. Ukraine? Yeah. Now, uh, however, there's no, there's no drive for p nations to join Russia. Uh, at least in, in terms of being absorbed by Russia. But yes, there is massive expansion of nation to nation trade uh, done in national currencies. Um, there's an organization called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. There's something called the Eurasian Infrastructure Bank. Um, Putin just spoke for four hours straight at something called the Valdai Club. This just happened two days ago. Can you imagine Joe Biden speaking, you know, expostulating for four hours on anything? There were 41 nations there, Charles, okay? You How know, many of the 41 want to join Russia? Well, no one's talking about it. If you're talking about joining Russia in terms of absorb, being absorbed into Russia, no one wants that. But um, 
What but, do you want? Well, what is what is what the world's moving toward right now is away from the dollar denom domination toward uh, new arrangements to finance development. See, the key in an economy is not the money; it's 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 the the right to uh, progress to overcome poverty. Right. So, for example, you know, there's been these great, you know, Russia was kicked out of the SWIFT, you know, the, the SWIFT system, the whole currency exchange system that was threatened even before Putin moved in. You know, if, if Russia, if Putin moves into Ukraine, we'll kick them out of SWIFT. We'll teach them. Right. So they must have known that Russia was planning to move. That was when the real shelling of the eastern provinces got very intense in mid-February. Well, what's happened? Russia was kicked out of SWIFT. Um, so they're selling their oil in uh, rubles and um, in uh, in uh, rupees. You know, a great expansion of India-Russia trade in rupee ruble arrangements. Um, um, you know, in what? in yuan and so forth. Right. So so that's what they're when. So they are joining Russia in terms of saying we ain't going down with the ship. You know, of Western finance. Anyone that's not an idiot knows. And there are a lot of idiots out there, you know, if someone when I'm out in the field and someone acts really stupid at the table, one question that's almost a, a just a bullseye is, oh, yes. And how deeply are you in the financial markets? Right. And, and normally, the person, well, that's none of your business. I say, aha, gotcha. Right. Because if they're stuck in the Western financial markets, that's where their identity is, too. Right. But we're heading for a big bruising with the dollar crash, I think, right after this election. Um, and so under those conditions, I will tell you, when I ran for chairman of the Democratic Party down here in Harris County, Texas, my poster had a picture of me protesting a company called Enron, which was the highest ranking Fortune 500 corporation in America at the time the picture was taken. But that's what the Western banking elites are like. They're like Enron just before the crash. They're respected one day and they're crooks and criminals afterwards. Now, the answer is, what do we want? We want the U.S. to come to its senses, you know, you know, um, not bail out the criminals that got us into this mess and, order, and work in nation-to-nation -nation arrangements with other nations to overcome poverty and deal with the real problems in the world which can only be dealt with in the realm of nations and physical economy I have uh, three questioners left jake adelon and jacob after that i want to go to rebuttals uh if you haven't had a question yet uh i will still put you in if you haven't hey, can you uh, yeah. hey, can you can you hear me can you hear me all right yeah, we can, can you hear, hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Jay. Yeah, yeah. If 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 NATO is such if NATO is such a problem when we were in it, when we were in Afghanistan, why why did uh, why did Putin okay uh, NATO's use of a Russian military base in in uh, in Afghanistan? He didn't um, say anything about it then. Is this who am I talking to now? Is this That's Jake. His name is Jake. He's on the phone. Jake. Oh, okay. Um. What what time what what year are you talking about, Jake? What period? I don't know what year I don't know what year it was, but but the the point is that Putin didn't object to NATO expansion when we were when we were using uh, uh, Russian when NATO was using a Russian military base in Afghanistan. Well, there's a whole history to that. You remember the September 11th terror attacks? You know when right. they ha when they happened, uh, George W. Bush was down there in Florida reading my pet goat to a bunch of kindergarten kids. So he had been yeah. hus hustled out of town, and Shane right. and the big boys were running things. But right. you know, and of course, it was very confusing and shocking to the people on the ground, including me. You know, although in my head I thought immediately, "Aha, Reichstag fire," because Larouche had warned about this in Congress uh, eight months before. But the first person to call George W. Bush and offer, look, I offer you my full support, you know, and cooperation to get yeah. to the bottom of yeah. that. The first person to call Bush was Vladimir Putin. OK, he says, wow. uh, I I'm telling the missiles to stand down. There will be nothing. You know, we will cooperate on this thing. It might have been under that context that Putin did accede to having a NATO 
uh, thing, force in Afghanistan. Now, if you know the history of this thing, quickly, under Jimmy Carter and Jabig New Brzezinski, um, you know, um, uh, Osama bin Laden was a U.S. intelligence asset against Russia. I know. Okay, you know, I know about that. that. And this okay. was Sure. So I think that's probably the answer to your question. Okay. So, so you, wait, 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 I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. So if that's if that's the case, why why is NATO such a threat to Putin now? All right, we're up with that, Jake. I'm going to have to let him answer his question and move on. We still got three more people left. Okay. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, am I still on? I thought yeah, you're still on. I just uh, oh, the, the the question is why is NATO a threat now? Why, why is NATO such a threat? Why is NATO such a threat to Putin? Well, first of all, there was a duplicitous game at work here in uh, NATO moving into Afghanistan. Um, you, you said you knew about some of this. Uh, uh, you know, the September 11th attacks um, activated something called Article 5 of the NATO Charter. Article 5 says. Um, an, an attack on one is an attack on all. Right, right, and, right, right. And so, so since the, the all the media was all jacked up that Afghanistan was where Osama bin Laden was hanging out, uh, the, yeah. and then then NATO was then therefore for the first time in its existence, uh, you know, and able to transplant itself into the middle of the Eurasian continent. That was a thirty-nation coalition, albeit headed by the U.S. and the British. That ran that war. Okay, now, yeah. you know, NATO uh, and uh, Western foundations, um, and I did a whole class on this for the Dallas group, which is maybe is archived down there, called "Abolish NATO." But they sponsored during the 1990s what were called color revolutions, right? The yeah. Violet Revolution in the Czech Republic, the Rose Revolution in Georgia. The original Orange Revolution in Ukraine, um, yeah. you know, things were not peachy under the. Who communist. was they? Wait a minute. Who was who was they? Who was they? The National Endowment for Democracy and private foundations. George Soros okay. has something okay. called the Open Society Foundation and others. You okay. know. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. And yeah. of course, there was a lot of discontent. There was discontent with how things were under the communists. So the argument was, well, if you go with us you'll just you'll just be just like milk and honey like like the western europeans are right so with yeah, this yeah, yeah. blandishment so the governments were overthrown and then immediately um took a vote and they all, and joined nato as i told you sweden there were 200,000 people out in the street protesting against yeah. nato you know but the government said, uh, we don't give a shit. We're going to join anyway, right? Yeah, but that, 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 that's beside the point. Now, after, after, after Putin invaded Ukraine, they want to join NATO. Okay, Jake, we're going to have to cut uh, you off. Let me, let me, he, didn't, he didn't answer the question, so let, me, let, let him finish <laughs> the question. Jake, obviously you were spaced out during my whole class, okay? It was a, there was yeah. a long-term project to bring neo-Nazis into power in Ukraine, and, and with them, nuclear weapons aimed at Russia. You yeah, know, I, I reject. Know. I reject that. I reject that. They okay. gave up the. They gave up the in 1990. Uh -huh. let, let me finish. In 1994, uh -huh. they gave up the nuclear. Ukraine gave up the nuclear weapons to to Russia in exchange for a non a non aggression. It was essentially uh -huh. a non aggression. And that's, pact. and that's what they wanted, and that's what they voted for was neutrality. Okay. But, right. But that was unacceptable. Looks All like right. Kel Kelvin Mach Marchette has her hand up, or, or Kelvin has his hand up over there. Yeah, and I know Bob Matter. I'm going to go Kelvin, and then Bob Matter, and Jacob. I'm, I'm going to go Kelvin, Bob Matter, Jacob, and then Adelon, and then we'll put the questions. Okay, Kelvin, you're next. On mute, please. Yeah, okay. Um, my question is, and I've heard quite a few of the um, pro-Russian side arguments on this. My question is, do you not think your case would have more validity if you didn't airbrush Russia's party in certain things. For example, you quickly brushed over the uh, Ukrainian uh, problems that, that Stalin caused in uh, Ukraine uh, in, 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 in the 30s. You know, forget that, you know, a few million people dead here and there, you know, um, 
you know, but by the Bible, concentrate on the hundred thousand people that were killed in a bit later. Okay, fair enough. Um, do you not think that uh, I didn't notice any mention of Putin's mentor Alexander Dugin, um, who was particularly mm -hmm. right? Um, not a, not a mention of the curtailing of democracy in Russia itself uh, and suppression of opposition parties. That's that wasn't part of the talk at all, I noticed. Um, I just wondered, don't you think your case might be made a little bit stronger by the inclusion of um, some even handedness? Are you done? Yeah. Well, I, um, if, if you could uh, go into the archives of the classes I gave in Dallas. I'm not in Dallas, I'm on Zoom tonight. Okay, but I'm just telling you that I was given an hour and so I had to edit out certain things I included before. Mm -hmm. There was, um, there was, as I said, in the 1930s, uh, 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 what was called the collectivization of agriculture in Ukraine that was carried out by Stalin, in which several million people did die. Yes, and this is why some of these people welcomed the Nazis when they invaded from the West. As far as democracy, bullshit. You know, I just told you about democracy in America with my friend Diane Sayre, who's not being allowed to uh, enter the debate. In England, where you had a prime minister in and out of there in 44 days, and, um, you know, somebody goes in the back room and appoints a new prime minister. Uh, oh, by the way, to answer your question, the same people who, answer, uh, who vote for the general okay. And, and okay. thirdly, as far as genocide is concerned, what really uh, got LaRouche um, a, a sense of having to take responsibility was that in World War II, he was in Calcutta, okay? Now, you want to talk about mass murder, you look at what the British did to India with the yeah. Bengal famine where they took all the no, food out. No, concept, yes. no contest, no contest that we were Okay, at, okay, the, okay. In mitigating so, circumstances, so, 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 so the, circumstances, we so, were up so against. The, so those periods. We were standing alone against, against, against uh, uh, two world superpowers that were out, out, out to put people in cow trucks. So, so, so it was, it was, what was, it was, what was so, Stalin up against? What was Stalin up against in 1930s when he went, when he starved the people of Ukraine? You see people, you think people don't forget this kind of shit? Um, so those periods, yeah, it was harsh. Were it not really for one man, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, the world might have entered a dark ages from which it would never recover. Okay. Well, there was, 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 no was there's no I in team, and there was a couple of other people around that that, that, um, that, that were there. Not just people like uh, Winston Churchill, but people like Clement Attlee and uh, Nye Bevan. Uh, who were socialists that were also on the on, on other sides against against Hitler as well. Um, anyway, I can't cover everything in every class, but okay. I acknowledge the problems with um, the, um, <coughs> communism, and and the, the and, and this this has been a, a battle because the argument you get um, in. Kelvin, is that your only two choices are communism and, and maybe a social version called socialism. Well, yeah, exactly. and, then, and, then, and, then, and then on the other side is Wall Street liberal free market economics. And, and you're you only and you're only consenting on what is it very to, to my okay. mind. Very Kelvin, so hard, Kelvin, hard, Kelvin. Anyway, I'm I'm not airbrushing anything in okay, Russia. Okay, Kelvin, we're gonna have we gotta move on, okay? Okay. I okay. got got our we got our caller who was uh, earlier tonight that let go. 744-2935 on mute. Go ahead and ask your question. There's a caller there, 784 uh, I don't know who that is, but if you're, you're on. It's usually star six on a phone, or maybe there's a little bell in your lower left, the green, which you can click right. on to unmute. Right. Are you there? Star six to unmute. Uh, we were trying to get you, but uh, obviously. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Who are, who are you? Okay. Right, right. So, so you didn't really finish answering the question before. I just want to know briefly what's what's the problem? What's the problem now with NATO? Why why is Putin so paranoid about NATO? Okay. Yeah. Were you on two phones? Yeah. Can you hear me now? 
Yeah, we can hear you, but you already talked, Jake, so I'm going to mute you on this one. No. Okay, no. no I, I, he did. All right, next next questioner, please. Uh, Bob Matter. Bob Matter, please go ahead. Thanks. Okay, Joe, um, if, uh, if, if Putin uh, fell for some reason, do we know who, the, who is lined up behind him? Who would be the next leader? Um, I don't have any inside um, uh, material on that. Of course, Medvedev is still around, who served before as president, and they switched places for a while. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It's just that, that this guy, Putin, I would really encourage people. It, it will surprise you if you listen to this presentation he made at the Valdai Club, V-A-L-D-A-I, right? He's, you know, he's in dialogue and, he, uh, and he's answering questions for four hours straight with press and people from all over Russia, right? So he's using this dialogue to try to cu cultivate a cadre of people to follow in his footsteps. He himself says, I don't want this job forever, you know, but he's kind of like the Franklin Roosevelt of Russia. He's kind of like the indispensable person right now. He's not, he's six, I think he's 68, 69. So he's certainly younger than Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And, you know, um, but he's, but I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it's just that I really think we need to negotiate something while while Putin's in there because he is not the hardliner. There's a lot of people, you know, among the military that are saying, you know, we're 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 fed up with this crap. Go in there, you know, um, you know, let's just, you know, just let's just roll in and totally occupy Ukraine and bomb the, you know, Putin is not wanting to do that, you know. He's but but it's a war now, right? Right when you know you had the the pipelines blown up, right? Um, you had the bridge, the Kursk bridge, uh, blown up. You know how, how how that was, right? It was a a truck with explosives just happening to blow up as there was a fuel train going the other direction, right? Um, you know, uh, so they're re they're retaliating by bombing in uh, infrastructure on the other side. It's oh, dual use, and people are dying. It's bad. <clears throat> Now, Joe, do you think the the Democrats are uh, willing to, uh, you know, take this all the way to to atomic war, just because they're afraid of uh, or their their distaste for um, a a, con a country like Putin's that is for traditional values and uh, you know Christianity and basically uh, you know anti gay, anti-trans, do you think that's what's uh, fueling the, uh, the democratic obsession with toppling Putin, even if it means nuclear war? Putin is for Christian values? It's a dog state. Well, he support, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a uh, Orthodox, it's a Christian Orthodox state. And uh, yeah, you know, that's, uh, well, you, you know, know, that's a thing that seems to irritate Democrats. Yeah, Go ahead, Joe. Um, Russian. Yeah, well, Russian. I, he actually has talked about this. You know, the uh, the um, uh, that his uh, Putin's uh, press uh, spokeswoman uh, is a uh, lady named M uh, Maria Zakharova. She's she's really foxy looking lady, but she's got a very sharp tongue. You know, and on the question that Boris Johnson was was forced out. And there's this hue and cry for, oh, well, we need a, there should be a female prime minister coming in. You know, it could Boris Johnson come? And Maria says, well, you know, they, they, if, since they've agreed they can change their sex from one day to the next in England, sure, why not? Bojo could run again. <laughs> so that, that was a joke, right? But um, look, as I said, I was an executive member of the Democratic Party for 15 years down here, you know, and I was always trying to exhort the better traditions, you know, going back to John F. Kennedy and so forth, right? But people changed, right? And during the whole Trump period, day in, in day in and day out, I, I, I mean, uh, one lady I used to talk to is Sylvia Garcia, right? Who's now the congresswoman from Pasadena, right? I kind of liked her, but she was a she was the top Hillary, you know, lieutenant, 
right? And for four years, they bought this line that Hillary lost because of Putin. Hillary lost because of Putin. Putin did it. Putin, 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 you know? They end up actually believing that stuff, right? And so, yeah, I think they've kind of distorted their minds in a way. They say, yeah, we're going to get our vengeance, you know, against Putin for, you know, having Trump inflicted upon us by crushing Russia. I mean, they've become really weird, right? But hopefully, with interventions like what you saw with Ocasio-Cortez and others, we're going to begin to spark the conscience of some of these people. I don't care if people tend to identify with, you know, Democrat or Republican, because there's good people and jerks in both parties, right? Institutionally, the whole party system is pretty rotten. But, um, you know, Joe Biden was vice president when, um, when Obama, Team Obama sponsored the overthrow of the government of Ukraine. There was the whole question of Hunter Biden's dirty operations over there in Ukraine, you know, and, and the laptop and all of that stuff. So, um, so I, I, as I said, I think, you know, America has, is going to get knocked off its high horse, you know, um, with a, 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 a really wrenching, um, traumatic, uh, you know, blowout of the dollar system itself soon after the election. And you've got to have a very, you know, or uh, or maybe uh, maybe when we run maybe when we run out of diesel fuel in 25 days. That's true. That's a physical limitation. These 18 wheeler trucks are what deliver most of your uh, food products to the stores and everything else. Physical reality. That's what counts. Saving people's lives, right? And you can't be like those people screaming at, you know, Izzy Arnstein there in 1984. You say, okay. We need Glass-Steagall to re-regulate the banks, and this is what we got to do. There, there ain't enough of us being that, you know, that calm boys in the, the, the burning theater. Okay, at this point, we have had, all the questioners have had previous questions. What we're going to do now is I'm going to convert the, our, our uh, thing over to rebuttals. It is getting to be 8.30. I'm going to give everybody about uh, three to four minutes. Joe, you're going to get the last word. We'll uh, speak until we're done. Adeline, you're first. And, and, and I would welcome from people I haven't heard yet, like uh, yeah. Raj, Raj over there and other people, you know, jump in. All right. So now that we're going to rebuttals, Adeline, you're going to go first. Jacob, you're going to go next. Uh, and let, let's, uh, Adeline was gone. Okay. We got Jacob. We got, got me. Nick, we got Charlie. We got Raj. We got Kel, and we got Kelvin. So I'm going to let Kelvin, since Kelvin's not, and then Bob Matter's going to go. Yeah, Tim, real, real quickly, I haven't got my hand up. Could you put me on the list? It's Ron. Yeah, I know Ron. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, then what I'll do is I'll go, um, I'll go Kelvin first, and then Ron, then Jacob, then uh, Jake, then Charlie. I'm sorry. Then then. You forgot me. All right, let's let's just go in and then whoever's ready. Okay, Kelvin, you're first. Go three minutes. Right, okay, I got three, four minutes. All right. Uh, this is, bear in mind when I'm telling this tale, this is from a country that's been a recent attack, uh, been recently attacked by Putin by mm -hmm. chemical we uh, weapons. Obviously on a very small scale, but it happened in 2018 in Salisbury. Um, once upon a time, Britain um, developed and settled uh, a land far, far to the west. Oh, yeah. uh, it nurtured that land, it nurtured that land, it defended that land against the superpower, France, and uh, successfully defended the, the inhabitants against being taken up by a foreign power. And then not unreasonably, they asked the inhabitants of that land to help pay for the cost of the defense. Now, certain rich owning uh, land owning elites in that land decided to, to, to uh, rile up the populace against the lawfully uh, constituted uh, authorities and uh, instill rebellion. And with the help of the this, this superpower that threatened them not a few years before, managed to overthrow the law, lawful authority. And people who disagreed with this, uh, this, this situation were forced to, uh, to, to migrate north as refugees. This is how America was born, an alternative view.
All right, Kelvin, since you're done, I'm going to let, since Ron hasn't said anything yet, I'm going to let him go next with his rebuttal. So, Ron, I'll give you three minutes when you're ready to start. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine, Ron. Well, I guess my rebuttal takes the um, form of a kind of a challenge that, um, you know, in all these situations and discussions, we all come with different ideologies and notions of history. Most of them uh, tend to be a bit abstract uh, in light of the actual question that was put on the table tonight, that um, we are in this face-off. It actually took an, a more deeper level and shift today with this um, attack on various uh, Russian ships and the uh, counter deployment now is saying that not only did the Ukrainians do that, but they had the help of the British Empire in doing it in the process of explaining that. Uh, and just so people who don't know, I also organized with the uh, Schiller Institute and the LaRouche organization that Joe's with. Um, but you have in the court, if you have in the course of that announcement and Russia countering this, they actually said publicly that um, the British were involved and did the bombing of the, and destruction of the, um, the, um, the uh, pipelines. So what you've got is a whole new dynamic that's setting up through the weekend, even by Monday morning, putting exactly on the table what uh, Joe was trying to talk about, that the only way you're gonna solve this is get a discussion that deals with the people actually orchestrating this. And um, there's a completely worked out program that people can find. I put the uh, link to the Schiller Institute in the, in the chat. There's been a series of conferences over the last year and a half culminating one that just took place on Thursday. So people should look that up. But the warning I started with is that people tend to view things uh, and have a, a reading on it, but the, the real factor is the measure of the actual dynamics in history and what's the willful role in that history. And right now, everybody on this call and in the United States and the world has a role to play to, as Joel maybe want to come back to a bit, we can actually put this mountain of paper through a bankruptcy, gear the credit to physical economy, opening up 1.5 billion productive jobs around the world, 60 million in the United States, just building what we need to have. And it's nations cooperating to do that. That is on the, the table. So my rebuttal is to keep your own, a notion of your own ideologies in mind and learn something as opposed to come back with a fixed kind of response. Okay, okay, uh, that's good. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Jacob go next. So go ahead, Jacob. Unmute, Jacob, you're next. You're next, Jacob. Three minutes. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jacob. Okay, so first of all, we have to see the big picture. <clears throat> this is not a, uh, the main war is between the United States, the plutocrats in the West, versus Putin who refuses to bend the knee to the financial bankster elite. So um, Ukraine, unfortunately, is in the middle. The people of Ukraine are a political football. They're in the middle of this and they're suffering. They're collateral damage from the point of view of the plutocrats. Um, so what is the solution? What we need more than ever, we need a president of the United States, has executive, uh, a, a, uh, he's the commander in chief to go into the files of the CIA, the NSA, and reveal the top secret documents that will expose once and for all, without a shadow of a doubt, so everybody's on the same page. Because right now we're just guessing. We're getting, there's so much misinformation, disinformation out there. You have this opinion, the other person has that opinion. It's crazy. So more than ever, we need a president who's going to spill the beans by showing the documents, posting them on the internet for all the world to see, exposing the activity, the agenda of the plutocratic families. And then, and, and more than ever, do we need whistleblowers, people on the inside who have firsthand eyewitness experience with what's going on to come out. Uh, we need people like Julian Assange, who's collecting the information and bringing it to the, Amer to the people of America to let them know so that they're well informed. Because the major problem is that we're not well informed. There's so much misinformation, disinformation out there. Uh, we're turning to unreliable, untrustworthy sources of information. Then we're forming our ideas, op opinions, points of view, 
based on garbage. We have to make sure that we have accurate information. And there's nothing better than the president getting into those files of the intelligence agencies and, and bring them. We need to see documents, you know, hard evidence, right? And we need whistleblowers to come forward. They, we have many, but we need even more to come forward and spill the beans, both in the FBI, the CIA, more than ever. Because the average American citizen is not going to believe anything. They're going to go, what are you talking about, Jacob? When I present evidence, they're going to say, what? So, but if they say it, if they come forward, then people will believe it. They'll see the documents. They'll see the evidence. And then we'll bring these people into a court of law and, 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 and try them for treason and cr for crimes against humanity. Okay, Jacob. Uh, so we need to do everything we can to make, to elect, just let me end with this, to elect a president who is stronger than Trump. Trump was weak. He bent the knee. The reason he people voted for him, they had the belief that here's a, here's a person who's going to go to Washington and spill the beans, clean the swamp up, right? He didn't do that. He had four years. I tell this to the Trump people. I'm not a Trump person. I tell them, look, he's not it. We've got to find somebody stronger who's not afraid of dying, right? They must stand up because it's going to be pushback from the plutocratic families hey, against the okay. presidency. Okay, okay. okay, bro. All right, we, 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 we got it. Okay, next, uh, Jake, I'm going to give you your three minutes, so go ahead. Jake, you're on mute. Go ahead, you got three minutes. Jake? All right, Charlie, you're next then. Jake's not responding. Uh, Charlie, you're next. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, hey, hey. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, let's let, Jake, let Jake go, and then we'll get Charlie. No, Jake, don't let him yeah. go because he doesn't know how to fucking use it. Yeah, NATO is not the problem. Because of, because of Putin's action, NATO will be expanded. There's no question about that. Um, maybe... Maybe, maybe, maybe Putin is responding to something going on in the West, but that does that does not um, that does not justify what he did in Ukraine. He went to the city of Mariupol, which is on the Black Sea, and I don't know the numbers, but apparently he killed twice as many pe people in Mariupol as Hitler killed uh, 75 years ago. It's not exact, not exactly an innocent person, is it? Um, yeah, if Putin, if Putin is being uh, Putin is being demonized, and maybe it's because he deserves to. That's all I'm going to say now. Oh, one other thing. One other thing. Uh, one other thing too. Um, his 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 use his use of the his use of uh, castigating the Ukrainians for uh, harboring uh, neo Nazis. Um, uh, Natalie Bennett, pre current president of Israel, came back immediately and set, lashed out at, at uh, him for that and said, um, you're, you're not, uh, how did he put it, um, you're, you're not, not going to use the Jewish people as cover for, uh, for killing Ukrainian civilians. We're not going to let you get away with it this time. Oh, he's, he's the guy. All right. Uh, all right, Jake, I'm going to. Let you go now. Uh, Charlie, you're next. Okay. Uh, please. Okay. Charlie. All right, I'd like to thank our speaker. Thank you, Mr. Jennings. For, uh, I was glad we were able to get you in while we still are on Zoom. And thank you for your detailed uh, PowerPoint that I realized the kind of work that goes into putting these together. The question on everyone's mind is who do we blame for the war? Now, I find it difficult and impossible in any fashion to blame NATO. NATO is not an aggressive entity. And most recently joined by countries like Iceland, which do not have aggressive foreign policies. It's, it's, it's a responsive organization. So I, I don't perceive anything that NATO did to precipitate this. Now, regarding the Ukraine, our speakers try to present a case that the country is occupied by Nazis in some fashion, which is spurious at best. And according to someone not substantiated in any fashion, I find it difficult that there never were any presence of, of Nazis in this country. 
Anne hasn't been ever that. And I look at the third one. Do we blame the president of the United States? And as such as I do, must I find it difficult to perceive Joseph Biden as a <laughs> a warlike individual? Uh, he's not demonstrated any any excessive use of the military in any other part of the world. Yet I find it difficult to believe that at no time did I ever hear him state that we have to make greater use of our military, in particular against other countries such as Russia. Uh, now, now, who does that lead? That leads Vladimir Putin. Well, let's take a look at this guy. A Bolshevik KGB guy. Doesn't run a country, country that has a abysmal human rights record. There's probably 50 members of the press who've been done away with, from what I read. Um, he was uncontrolled the Trump for a period of years there. He had his lackey at his bidding. And most of all, in 2016, we were warned by the countries of the Eastern Bloc that Putin and the Russians were in, interfering in the internal affairs of other countries regarding their elections. They had an entire military unit okay. assigned to infiltrate and disrupt elections. In addition to that, Putin, and they were criminally charged, he sent in a dozen spies to cause problems in this nation. Now, to come along and to say, this is some kind of wonderful guy, I would got to say, what kind of an American are you? He has not posed himself as a friend of neutrality and unquestionably not a friend of this nation. He's okay. not my friend. Okay, I think and you're I three minutes are up. Charlie, there, so. Charlie, and I got to wonder about you're, anybody you're else. Three, that three minutes are up. Charlie, okay. you're three minutes are up. Yeah, we gotta, yeah, I want to yeah, well, hear from Raj, Bob, say. and Lee yeah, King. Okay, let's, yeah, let's you know what treason is? All right. Yeah, treason stealing time. No, okay. treason is... Hi, Raj. Gone. How you doing, Raj? Tell us All what's right, on your mind, Raj. All right, Raj, let's go. They're traitors. Hey, I'm in charge. I want the mic. Give me this room. All right, Raj, you got, you got okay, your minutes. Uh, Charles, Charles might have a good memory, but uh, he doesn't know where, what America does. America overthrows the governments all over the world, and probably he Charles doesn't remember that. Maybe his memory getting frosty. The the when uh, Trump was president and. Uh, uh, he, uh, the Pelosi took a hard line against him and, and like a war. And I say, what a stupidity. The Trump, you can flatter him so much and you can get a lot, lot from him. But uh, Pelosi did not do it. And, uh, and uh, this is important thing in, in our country. We, we do not see ourselves, ourselves as a great leader. We are, we are in charge of the world. We have the resources, we have a know-how, and look what we are doing, and what, what lots of people are thinking. We want to cover the, we want to go to Afghanistan, a poor country, and then we smash it, and, tie, and don't know why we are going. We did in Iran, Iraq. I mean, what is going on? And and and, and, and Ukraine, 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 the their per capita income was about ten dollars a year, okay. I'm not, not ten dollars. I'm not ten dollars. What do you call it? Something, something, ten thousand dollars a year. Okay, so it's not a rich country. Okay, and uh, Putin, whatever he eat, I do think that you can do business with him. He talks. Okay, and he wants to move on. The problem with our president is that he 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 has a thing in a mind which bothers him for years and decades. And this he thinks is opportunity to go to war with Ukraine and Russia and to go to war with China and fix it. He cannot fix it. 
He doesn't. He doesn't have a cabinet. He doesn't have a support in a Congress. He doesn't understand the issues. Okay, and and it, it's a problem for me. But it's America to go forward. And our and you know and. Okay. President, President, my time. President, able to do what he wants to do, but the American people supports him. And he says, American people, they are at fault for anybody there. We elect the leaders, and we do let them go to war. We go, let them go to adventures, and that is not good for us. That is not good for the world, and uh, not it, no for nobody. What he got it by the the president never thought about that. He got a recession in the whole world. He divided the whole world. And he made so many enemies that they will hound us. Nobody, small country cannot okay. trust us. Anymore. Raj, I understand. I understand. Hey, Raj, we know we. I think I think we're going to lose the signal at nine o'clock. So Bob, oh, no, Bob? We, we 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 got we got the signal for a while. Okay, um, Bob. Yeah, Bob. Let's go. I acknowledge your pro what you're saying, Raj. Absolutely. Oh, okay. The uh, so the, the the big issue I think that that everybody uh, basically basically in the country seems to be ignoring almost is that. You know, we are flirting with nuclear war. And the only way we're going to stop this, we have to stop it. The only way is that on November 8th, we all have to get out there and you have to vote Republican up and down from school board uh, on up to senator. We, that's the only thing we can do to stop this. The Democrats are hell bent. You know, they used to be the party of uh, the plan, yeah. peace. An anti-war. Now they're the now they're the party of war, and we've we've got to stop them. The only thing we can do is vote Republican to bring some sense back, and let and, and cool this thing off uh, before it gets it gets any worse. Now I posted yeah, yeah. a little uh, uh, quote in the chat session segment there from uh, Democratic Congressman Jamie Jamie Raskin. And if you, you could just uh, Google Jamie Raskin press releases, and it's his second to the last, uh, second to the one that he's got listed up there right now. But this expresses the Democratic feeling, and this has been a uh, feeling that uh, actually the, the West has had for a long time. But in that, but really, it's yeah, the party, it's the Democratic party. party. This, this this feeling that they're time. always right, and they always want to move. You know, progressiveness saying that oh, progressive is the is the best way of the future for everybody, and they're pushing this, uh, you know, transgenderism and gay marriage no. and all this stuff on everybody. You. And you hate and uh, we, you know, and Putin and like many others reject that, but but that's what the Democrats are pushing. Bob, for. Bob, so aren't uh, Republican, anyway, aren't you, aren't okay. Now let's let's okay. So anyway, just vote vote Republican November eighth, and let's stop this uh, pending nuclear war. Okay, okay. I got to rush to the train. I'll get oh, back no. on my phone later. Okay, All right, Li thanks, Li Ping. Bob. Li, Li Ping. Ping's next. Okay, Li Ping, you want to unmute? Then uh, you got three minutes. By the way, Li Ping, went welcome again. I'm glad to see you back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, a topic I'm uh, very interested in. And uh, uh, thank you for the speaker. Uh, I learned a lot uh, about the details, but uh, I'm still uh, not convinced that uh, uh, Putin is a peacemaker or a peaceful person. Yeah, he whatever uh, started the, the, the war, that's uh, not a, a problem. Not, not a question, and uh, and uh, I I'm, uh, truly believe that. Another thing, uh, during the uh, speech, you briefly mentioned the the China, the uh, exactly it's the People's Republic of China, uh, it's the Communist China. Uh, they they are uh, growing fast, and they are making lots of friends in, in uh, nationally, internationally. But uh, they are not a peaceful, uh, especially this uh, current president, Xi. Uh, since he grabbed the power, she, he removed all the uh, political uh, oppositions and uh, 
uh, the only people left is the his uh, lawyer list, and uh, uh, so uh, his uh, his action is not uh, a peaceful action, and uh, he doesn't allow anybody to speak uh, any different voice. Uh, another way you can see he is not peaceful is uh, he his. Uh, uh, military exercise against Taiwan uh, used to be uh, keep a distance, uh, but uh, now it's uh, at the doorstep. Uh, he he is uh, showing his military power, uh, threatening threatening Taiwan uh, in a uh, in a big way. So you're and, with Nancy uh, Pelosi on that one, huh? Uh, I think that's just an excuse. Uh, he did that uh, gradually, not uh, specifically. Uh, he take this chance to 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 show off his military, but before that, his military has circled Taiwan for many many years. Okay, that's uh, that started uh, from uh, when he was in uh, power, okay, and uh, get... also recently. During the Communist Party, the, the most important party, he physically ordered, physically removed of his ex-president from the seat, and uh, to prevent him vote anything no. Uh, I think that's showing how he, he is so determined to dominate, to control everything. He is. Uh, uh, he's not a, a peaceful person. Okay, That's Lee, I'm going to have to leave it Thank there, you. all right? Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, Jake, you've already spoken a couple of times, so I'm just going to let Ron, uh, I mean, I'm going to let Joe Jennings uh, wrap up with his final remarks, and we'll adjourn about nine-ish or so. All right, let's so, thank uh, Joe. Speaker, and uh, we'll keep the Okay, well, listen, once again, thank you. You know, we're all we're allowed to not all agree with each other, uh, but we have to solve the problem. And what Bob said, I'm sorry he had to duck out about the danger of nuclear war. This is for real. This is for real. Um, and it's difficult for people to conceive of because you live here. Those of us that remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which I do, Right, there was an immediate existential uh, danger with those uh, nukes being, you know, stationed off the coast of Mi uh, Miami, basically 70 miles off. And there were factions in the uh, Pentagon that were all gung ho to go to nuclear war with Russia, you know, or the or the brink of it to, to force a back down on on part of Khrushchev. Okay. Thank God, Kennedy, who was no no weakling, for heaven's sakes, you know he, he he you know he served in a PT boat in World War II, which was blown up. He he had to you know swim to safety. He saved many other guys' lives. You know, everyone should read Profiles in Courage and read it again. It's about individual acts of courage uh, of people that stood up against the tide. Now. Um, What's driving world events is the inevitability of the collapse of the Western dollar-denominated bubble, which has become bloated with over two quadrillion dollars worth of, of unpayable gambling debt. Ron Batag alluded to this. Now, what do you do? You either have to say people are precious and the gambling debt is not, and write off that debt, you know, write off the gambling and move forward using the Roosevelt example of Glass-Steagall, or you have to say the debt is sacred and the people are expendable. And that's called fascism. That's where you're grinding up people to pay debt. Now, the Western plutocrats, if you want to call them that, you know, are freaked out because they thought they'd be the last man standing at this point in history and because both Russia and China took some counsel from LaRouche. And I will tell you, Mrs. LaRouche was very much at the center of the transformation of China 
from the cheap labor sweatshop that everyone you know benefited from every time you went to the Walmart in the 70s to the the uh, scientific power they've become today albeit the Communist Party of China is still in control well no one bitched about the Communist Party in the 70s when they were obedient little cheap labor producer right and the fact and do you think that um, you know um, uh, Lindsey Graham and Ted Cruz and all the people that hyperventilate about Taiwan give a crap about the people that actually live there no they don't care about any more than they care about the normal people in Ukraine they just want to see Taiwan become a um, you know a, a NATO base for threatening Russia and China even though there is no threat from us I asked the person that's freaked out about China how many nations in the world does China have troops in you know how many foreign bases you want to know how many foreign bases the US has in places like Niger and Africa and Somalia and Djibouti and all over we've got over 700 bases in the world but it's not bad America it's what's called a dumb dog on a British leash okay you know everyone should read the um, Shakespeare play Othello you know about you know um, you know Othello is like a dumb jock you know that's manipulated by uh, by Iago. Oh, I'm your true and honest friend, you know. And and every piece of advice he gives, he, um, Othello leads Othello to his own destruction. And that's what the British intelligence control has done to our great nation, including the corruption of the culture. Now on Jeff, um, oh, well, um, Ra and Ra well, I'll, I'll just both Raj and Jeff at the same time because Raj was despairing of Biden you know Jeff was saying well what do we do what do we do what do we do we've you know we've got to have more whistleblowers we need a president that will open it up well you may not get that you know I don't see anyone out there you know I'm, I'm doing my best over the next 10 days well even over the next 24 hours to get Diane Sarah into that debate with Chuck Schumer so she can you know whip the pants off that guy in an open debate which she would win if given the opportunity but if you want to blow the lid on the intelligence services, there's one way to do it, okay? We have to force the opening up the files on the LaRouche case, okay? I was in Leesburg when the FBI raided my offices in 1986, grabbed the computers, ransacked my desk, sent helicopters around the LaRouche's house. You know, I, it, I, it happened. I saw it. Now, what was he doing in 86? We should look into that. But when it went to the Supreme Court, you know, we also sent letters to Janet Reno, because, um, you know, who is um, Attorney General, who sent the letters? Ramsey Clark, the former Attorney General of the United States, you know, the one that marched with Martin Luther King and Amelia Robinson across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965 for, for, you know, voting justice, right? He said the LaRouche case is the most egregious, outrageous abuse of power of any case he had ever seen to my history and to my knowledge. That that beats the uh, Mar-a-Lago raid on, on Trump's place, Roger Stone, Please. Julian Assange, all of them, okay? Now, it, it wasn't because LaRouche was some billionaire that had taken the White House like Trump. It was just the ideas he represented because he intervened in the anti, and this is, this is how I bring it to a close. It's not just enough to have an anti-war movement, okay? Frankly, I'll tell you, as a teenager, I went to a bunch of the anti-war rallies in Washington because I lived right outside of it. They said, oh, you're against the Vietnam War here. Take, take a smoke of weed, right? Which I, that didn't make any sense to me, right? You have to actually understand why these wars are happening, right? And, and fight for a positive alternative. So our next conference of the Schiller Institute is going to happen on uh, November the 22nd or it might be the 23rd Ron and you can correct me on that where we're having a growing circle of legislators around the world and and this is this this discussion is bringing into existence what we call a new Bretton Woods financial architecture to keep civilization moving forward peace through development okay you want peace you got to fight poverty you, and that means you know the, the right of every nation to have the blessings of development as opposed to a privileged few okay serving 
you know, being served by everybody else. So I would encourage you to go to the Schiller Institute website, look at this speech by Putin at Valdai, you know, and the people that, and what Charles said about NATO, look, just go back and listen to my class again. I was very clear on, on the NATO. Mr. Question. Jennings, yes. uh, you know, who's, I don't mean to interrupt you. Thank you so much. Who's there? Oh, Alana? Is uh, this Alana? Okay, go yeah. ahead. I just uh, one word. I am sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. You That's know, fine. his speech and well die. You know, I from former Soviet Union. Oh wow! So, okay. Yeah, I'm citizen. I'm I'm very good. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, uh, do svidanya. Uh, we will say do svidanya when you will uh, wrapping up uh, oh, your okay. program. Uh, Pozvolita. I know that. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Ili Privet. 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 Yeah. Okay. Help. Yeah. Okay, what do you want to, what do you want to say? So what I want to say, you know, I heard briefly from the radio, some of the Russian radio, good sources, you know, about his speech on Valdai. It's, you know, I don't know how to describe, just, I listen in original, you know, like in his language, you know, Russian language, because I speak fluently. So, oh. does it make sense not one word what he said it's scary it's like sickening really it, it it was no connection like pure hallucination in schizophrenia because you know he lie every word what he said in Valdai speech you know why because he don't have nothing to say <laughs> you know he lying you know he lying he lying because he said he won a negotiation with Zelensky no Absolutely not. And Zelensky, the right. No, it's, it's Zelensky but, says he doesn't want to negotiate. Exactly. Right. Because so, he, doesn't trust, he doesn't trust him no more. He won a negotiation immediately, you know, when war uh, started, you know, on March or February. Yes, or February. and, and there, yes, and there was a plan. And you know who shot it down? Who, you know, whoever went to, to Kiev and ordered Zelensky not to negotiate? You know who, who? it was? Boris Johnson, me. Boris Johnson, who had just met with the Queen. It was the I British, guess. you know, and so this is what you're dealing with. And I, I, guess, I yeah, it, 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 depends, I guess, it depends. It depends. It depends on what. It depends. I guess, you, it depends, I guess, I it guess dep uh, Johnson right because he have experience, you know, and he <laughs> can really. Work. Okay, no, guys. I mean, maybe, okay, fine. Okay. It's controversial. It's controversial. Okay. All right. All right. But Johnson, I guess, he much more smarter than Putin. And you know what? When <laughs> Zelensky asked Putin negotiate like a long time ago, twice or three times, and Putin was refused. And now what Putin tried to say, I don't trust not one word, not one okay, word. Ilana, not Ilana I, I want you to go to YouTube, go to YouTube, and I, just I, punch, I, it, punch in Zelensky in stiletto okay. high heels and black stockings and watch the whole video of him prancing around in that pornographic dance that's the guy that <laughs> that, that joe biden that joe biden, has given, that joe biden has given 80 billion freaking dollars of weapons to so don't tell me biden is not something he well, well, pushed no, through 80 billion dollars of weapons to a bunch of nazis I mean, and the republicans I mean, are supporting him let's, let, let's look at it I mean, both don't don't to think the russians but, actually had a chemical attack on my country that killed one of my citizens. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, so let's, let's I, I think we're yeah. done, Tim. Anyway. But you know, Zelensky, Zelensky okay, all right. To okay. At this point, uh, okay, listen, Tim. All right, listen, 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 at this point. Okay, Tim. At this point, okay, Anna. He's the comedian. Let him finish. Oh, the thing, the thing is, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna take this now offline. I'm okay, what the uh, YouTube you recommend? Okay, thank you. Just look it up. Just go to YouTube and punch in Zelensky yeah. dance uh, okay. or something. It'll it'll show yeah. up. Yeah, it depends. It depends. It depends on what you mean. <laughs> okay, guys. It depends. Okay, listen. Um, listen. Uh, as I say at the end, um, the, we're 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 in a. This is not TV. You know, this is your life, right? Um. Like I said, when the FBI came into my office in Leesburg, Virginia, it was for real, okay? You know, they came in with Uzis and machine guns on October 6, 1986, the day that President Reagan was in Iceland sitting down with Gorbachev to negotiate a very, uh, negotiate a very 
generous plan for peaceful cooperation to stop nuclear war. So who is running the show in Washington, D.C.? Um, Poppy Bush, you know, who had been head of the CIA, you know, who was, 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 was resentful that he, he wasn't president, you know, and, and, and hated our movement because we had an independent intelligence capability advocating, as we do today, peace through development. Not brinkmanship, not genocide under the name of debt collection, you know. Um, and you guys have your, your little chat every week, but I, I get the feeling that none of it's really very real. The misery being brought on other nations by the fact that the U.S. is the biggest perpetrator of war in the world. What has happened to uh, Libya and Iraq and Afghanistan? you know, through the U.S. wars, right? Now, now Putin and China both see the handwriting on the wall that NATO, which, um, you know, is, has, has had no reason for existence after 1991, you know, is, um, is becoming the enforcer for fascism the world over. And I'm going to keep fighting it. So blessed are the peacemakers, guys. Go watch some of the earlier classes I did for the Dallas group. You know, and um, and 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 um, plug into the Schiller Institute conference on November the 22nd. But go to the previous one that we did with young people. We had 150 young people there. You know, how many of you know all passionate, and they're all going to do more interventions like what we did with Barack Obama on this question in Detroit <laughs> just this afternoon at Renaissance <laughs> High School. You can look it up on YouTube. Renaissance High School, Barack Obama, my two friends. Put him in his place. Thank you very much. All Let's right. Pretend. And at this point, we're going to close Joe. out. Okay. Good night. We're going to close that out. Bye. Now, if you want to stay on afterwards with the no. call, that's fine. I'm not. I'm, not. I'm, I'm out of here. Thanks a lot. But, uh, thank you, Joe, very All much. Right. Thank care. you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. And I appreciate thank everybody you, commenting tonight. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. It is now Thank officially closed.